This is Jason Anderson, and I'm calling this special town council meeting to order. It is currently 7 p.m. on February 21st, 2024. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all here safely. We thank you for the position you've put us in, and we just ask you for your guidance, your wisdom, for us to make the right decisions for everyone in town, our residents, our businesses. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For roll call purposes, all council members are in attendance. At this time, we'll move on to item 5A, adoption of minutes of previous meetings. 5A, a special town council meeting, January 2nd, 2024. And 5B, adoption of minutes from the regular town council meeting, January 9th, 2024. Can I get a motion to adopt these? So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Uh, corrections, comments? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to item six, presentations, proclamations, and declarations. Ms. Wakefield, if you could do 6A, please. Proclamation recognizing February 17th to the 24th, 2024 as National FFA Week. Whereas FFA and agricultural education provides a strong foundation for the youth of America and the future of food, fiber, and natural resource systems, and whereas FFA promotes premier leadership, personal growth, and career success among its members, and whereas agricultural education and FFA ensure a steady supply of young professionals to meet the growing needs in the science, business, and technology of agriculture, and whereas the FFA motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, living to serve, gives direction and purpose to these students who take on an active role in succeeding in agricultural education, and whereas FFA promotes citizenship, volunteerism, patriotism, cooperation, and now therefore be it proclaimed by the town council of the town of Killingly that the week of February 17th, 20, 17th to the 24th, 2024, is hereby recognized as National FFA Week. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 21st day of February 2021. Thank you, Ms. Wakefield. Ms. Murphy, could you do 6B, please? Oh, Excuse we got, me, we, we got have a minute. If oh, we can, there we are, are members here from the FFA that would like to okay. say a few words. Right. And if I can get a picture of you guys shaking hands, mm -hmm. that would be great. Uh, thank you for supporting the Killingly FFA chapter and celebrating National FFA Week with us. The National FFA organization helps recognize and develop students' leadership roles. Through agricultural education, our chapter is committed to providing all students with a path to achievement and premier leadership, personal growth, and career success. Within the Killingly FFA program, students have many opportunities to develop skills and explore their interests and a broad range of agricultural pathways, with whether those interests are, are in farming, being a veterinarian, a horticulturist, a mechanic, a scientist, or an entrepreneur, among many more options. Thank you for recognizing the importance of agriculture in our daily lives and the value of, leader, of the leadership skills our students are developing through the National FFA organization. Thank you. Oh, yep. Hope you guys can stay there.
proclamation recognized in February 2024 as Black History Month. Whereas Black History Month is observed annually across the United States in February, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by African Americans to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. And whereas in 1915, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson, a noted historian and author, second African American to earn a PhD from Harvard University, founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which was later renamed the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And whereas Dr. Woodson initiated Black History Week on February 12, 1926, and for many years, the second week of February, chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, has been celebrated by African Americans in the United States. And whereas in 1976, President Gerald Ford officially declared Black History Month as part of the nation's bicentennial, Black History Week was expanded and became established as Black History Month and is now celebrated all across North America. And now, therefore, the Killingly Town Council does hereby proclaim the month of February 2024 as Black History Month, which is a time for honoring the significant achievements, inspirations, and contributions African Americans have made to our town, state, and nation. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 13th day of February 2024. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. We'll now move on to item 6C. Proclamation recognizing February 2024 as Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Awareness Month. Whereas Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Awareness Month is a national effort to raise awareness about abuse in teen and young adult relationships and promotes programs that prevent this abuse during the month of February. And whereas teen dating violence is a widespread problem affecting youth in every community across the nation. And whereas one in three young people are affected by physical, sexual, or verbal dating violence one in 10 in a serious relationship have reported being slapped, pushed, hit, threatened, or coerced by their partner. And recognizing breakups are at a time of greater risk even when a relationship was never physically abusive. And whereas young people can choose better relationships <coughs> when they understand that healthy relationships are based on respect and learn to identify early warning signs of an abusive relationship. And whereas elimination of dating violence must be achieved through cooperation of individuals, organizations, and communities, and young people across the nation have organized to put a stop to dating abuse and work alongside their adult allies to educate young people about this violence. And whereas Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Awareness Month provides an excellent opportunity for citizens to learn more about preventive teen dating violence and to show support for the numerous organizations and individuals who provide critical advocacy services and assistance to victims. Now therefore, the Killingly Town Council does hereby proclaim the month of February 2024 as Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Awareness Month in the town of Killingly. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 21st day of February 2024. Ms. George, could you do the next one, please? Sure. Proclamation recognizing February 2024 as National Library Lovers Month. Whereas libraries provide much more than a place for us to enjoy great novels or discover amazing adventures of untold history. Whereas in a world undergoing constant change, libraries provide enduring connections to the past and future of our communities, nations, and civilizations. Whereas the expansion of electronic networks linking libraries and their resources makes possible easy accessible, easily accessible information for library users around the world. Whereas libraries provide entry to important research about health, economics, housing, the environment, countless other areas to support better living conditions and to help people lead longer, more productive and fulfilling lives. Whereas libraries support a competitive workforce with basic literacy programs, <coughs> com computers, and other resources to help children and adults learn to find, evaluate, and use information they need for their jobs, health, education, and other needs. Whereas libraries offer preschool, story hour, and summer reading programs to encourage children to become a habit of reading that will serve to benefit their personal and professional lives. Now, therefore, the Killingly Town Council does hereby proclaim February 2024 as National Library Lovers Month and urges everyone to visit the library to explore the adventures and possibilities. 
Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 21st day of February, 2024. Thank you, Ms. George. Yeah. And on to item 6E, Mr. Grandelsky, please. Proclamation recognizing February 8th as the birthday of the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts of America. Whereas <coughs> the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts of America have served America's youth since 1910, when Chicago publisher William Boyce filed incorporation papers in the District of Columbia to create the Boy Scouts of America. Since then, the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts have found a profound impact on the United States. Presidents, astronauts, and other dignitaries have been Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts over the years. <coughs> and whereas, with more than one million members between the ages of five and 21, and more than 628,000 volunteers in local councils throughout the United States, the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts of America offer a tremendously valuable program of life skills and value for million of young boys and young men. The top award of Eagle Scout is an accomplishment that reach recognition, rewards, and benefits for a young man throughout his life. And whereas on February 8th, we celebrate National Boy Scouts Day in honor of those who are worthy, are trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. For over 114 years, the values learned through scouting have given boys and young men across the United States the confidence to make ethical choices and to realize their full potential as active and responsible citizens. And now, therefore, the town of Killing does hereby proclaim February 8, 2024, as the birthday of Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts of America, which is a time to honor the Boy Scouts and young men of the United States and the dedicated volunteers who help organize the numerous troops, meetings, and various community activities led by the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts of America. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated Killingly, Connecticut, this 21st day of February, 2024. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Grandelsky. Do you want to have them stand here and get the yeah. whole council in a picture? Yeah. Does any of you guys want to say anything? Go ahead. You can do the scouting handshake with your left hand. Go ahead. You can do the scouting handshake with your left hand. Thank you. <laughs> There's lots of merit badges. At this time, we'll move on to item 6F, presentation of payment management plan by Matt Duby, Highway Director. So if I can just kind of start, so um, as you'll, many of you remember, um, several years ago 
in 2018, the town performed a street scan. Um, and then in 2022, uh, 2021, the town council utilized that information. Matt had come and given a presentation on our road pavement conditions and a road pavement plan, an investment plan in our roads, which the council has followed and invested in our road infrastructure over the last couple of years. So I really wanted, you know, we're getting ready to go into budget season again. I wanted to have Matt be able to come forward, give you guys kind of an update of where we're at with the road condition, road health, what's, you know, what's been done in the system. Um, and um, we did have an updated street scan that was done in 2022. Fall of 22, yes. Fall of 22. So, you know, where does that put us and um, what are some of the changes that have occurred? So um, I'm going to let Matt kind of walk through this, but um, this I thought was a prime opportunity to really show you where we're at and, you know, what has the impacts been of just that um, continued deterioration that we had, how that investment has made a difference thus far, and also what, um, you know, in, how, it, how is inflation impacted this process? So go ahead, Matt. Uh, the first two are just obviously two maps of the town. The f one on the left is where we're currently at, and it kind of breaks down off of our last scan and any work we've done, um, just kind of color codes what roads are higher and lower. Um, it's kind of more so of just an overview. It's it's not necessarily anything more than just an overview. It's it's so hard. Every every one of these that you look at from every town will have a range that will have a lot of colors on it. And then on the one on the right is uh, Mary and I talked about what we really wanted to show. So in 2022, when I came to you guys and you first utilized the two and a half, just kind of as a reminder, that was we weren't going to utilize that going into the road work season in 2022. That was for road work in 2023. We were going to lag a year, which offsets us and helps because this is the time of year that I can start planning stuff and it, it gives us a full construction season to have work done and we're not trying to cram it all in from July to the end of the construction season. Um, so that's kind of a reminder of like 2022 was the first year that we had that money, but it really didn't get utilized until 2023. So if you go to the page two, this is what I showed you guys um, a couple years ago. This was our projections. Um, the 800,000 was kind of roughly where we were at, was like the lower end of what we were looking at. And then we just had some different options. This was utilizing, we were extrapolating what we had from 2018 and we were trying to figure out where we were in the spring of 22. So basically at the end of the season 21, we put ourselves at, we thought we were at a 66 because our original scan was like a, just a little under a 68. Well, when we had our scan done in 2022, when you guys turn the page, you'll see that we had underestimated how much deterioration we had. Um, we were actually at a 56.5 when they did the second scan in the fall of 2022, which they did change a little bit how they did it. I will say it was a much better scan. It was much more in depth. They changed their metrics on their grading system, which is really good, but also it's very aggressive. It's um, So their technology yeah. improved in that their scanning was far more um, comprehensive, right? So... Um, uh, they rated the bump factors of the road. They really picked up on spalling and um, minor cracking, which are early signs of that deterioration that may not necessarily have been as detailed in their 2018. And that's just that's just the progression in the technology of that scan process. So um, you know, this really gave us a really good um, understanding of where our conditions of our roads are. Um, at, in 2022, which is why we really chose to do it in um, fall of 2022, because that really was before the biggest investment. Where did we really start at? So then we could really kind of track where we're going with this. So, um, you know, Jen, if you can go to the next slide. And, and exactly. So the metrics that they use, there's a bumpiness score, a cracking score, a rutting score, which is all actually really helpful when it comes to an overview and picking treatments because a road that's a 60 because of rutting, you're going to do a different treatment on than a road that's a 60 because of potholes. And, and so it helps, but it definitely, um, it's definitely a lot more invasive than the first scan, which is 
is fine. It's, it shows us where we're actually at. It gives us a really good read on it. So these two lines, the green line and the red line, are from the previous slide. Those were your max and your min of where we thought we were going to be starting in 20, uh, 2023 once we started use, utilizing the money. As you can tell, we were a lot further down than we had thought. But once we started this past season, what we were able to do this this past season, which was the first season with that two and a half million, the trajectory continues on what we had thought. So that's right and encouraging. And even with the amount of work that we did this year, I felt it was a very efficient year. We covered a lot of ground and I felt like you would drive around town even if you were just cutting across town and you could notice that you saw a lot of places. We were I felt like I was always making those ads for the, the Facebook of, or for the, the town website of construction ahead this day. We're gonna be, like I felt like I was making one of those every three weeks, which is pretty much what it was. Um, and that definitely was a good problem to have. So this just kind of shows that, that two and a half did make um, a big difference, like we had said it was gonna. And one thing too, not to make an excuse or anything, but this gap, this first gap too, that year, in 2022 when we started work that was the first year that the war in Europe started we had hundred and thirty five thousand dollars in escalation because of oil so that took out a whole road right there so that hurt the the as you can see when we went down and I included what we had spent on every year from 21 to 22 there was a big jump and it was a million dollars more than what we had about investing and you can see the difference in the curve Granted, we hadn't, if we wouldn't have had that escalation, that probably would have been a lot more equal at that point. So it didn't make up the whole curve, um, that, whole, that whole gap. Some of the gap was the gap in technology for between the two scans. But between those two factors, that's one of the reasons why there was that drop. So this just kind of shows out we had talked about doing, um, there is, I just noticed there is one error on the graph. On the last one, it's at uh, the price isn't right, but it's in the right spot. It just isn't uh, the right price. It's supposed to be two and a half all the way out on that blue line. Um, but other than that, it just kind of shows where we're at and the money that you guys approved last year, that's going to be spent this year. So the December of 2024, that blue line, that's pretty much already where we plan to be. Um, I kind of already have our plan for the year. We're fine-tuning a few details and getting our prices back, but that pretty much is already set. So anything you guys change in our plan going forward will affect pretty much from December 24 out. So, I, I mean, I think everybody should be proud of what you guys were able to do. You guys made that commitment to utilize that money, and it, I, to me, I feel it made a very noticeable difference around town, and then it shows on this as well. And Jen, if you can go back to the map picture. You know, one of the things that um, we looked at in the pavement management, you know, that we discussed in the very beginning was that we, we know that we have some roads that really are going to be heavy lift roads. They're going to require full reconstruction. Um, and that can really um, absorb a lot of your resources all in one year. And so it tends to be heavily concentrated. Matt has really um, worked uh, looking at how can we best utilize it throughout the entire town? So, you know, we're making, we're maximizing that benefit um, as best as we can throughout the entire town. Now, coming into this upcoming construction cycle, um, we we know uh, we can talk about North Road. North Road is go that's a heavy lift road. That is, uh, it's a longer road. Um, it is in uh, a more difficult shape, so it does require full reconstruction, and that is going to absorb a lot more resources and therefore we get fewer roads done um, so you know there's alternatives around that um, I do have um, you know we've 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 watched and we continue to monitor the fund balance and the town has performed well with our fund balance we've been able to essentially um, with the turnbacks have happened that have happened annually um, for the 2023 year, we're almost finalizing audit at this point in time. We'll be finalizing in the next few weeks. Um, we're looking at a 22.25% fund balance, which is still a very healthy fund balance. Um, even if we continue to um, sustain that 2.5 million over the next several years, um, you know, we're, ex we're expecting to be able to sustain that, you know, through uh, 2028. Um, if you continue to um, 
allocate that resource of uh, two and a, of the two and a half million to roads, then we end up in 2028 with a very, and this is assuming very conservative turn backs of only $300,000 and that town and board of education combined, which we know we've been seeing higher than those numbers, you know, in totality, but using a very conservative turn back number, um, we're looking at a fund balance um, percentage of 14.8%, which is still, you know, right at the, at the, you know, cusp of our fund balance policy we want to keep it at that you know 15 to um, 18 percent mark but still um, in a very healthy position for borrowing purposes um, credit rating agencies stuff like that so it's a very mindful purpose um, and use for the 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 dedication of the fund balance it's been a very easy explanation to our credit rating agency that um, you guys are making it for investments in the road infrastructure um, which is not a, um, you know, if you needed to stop doing that in a year um, because there was some emergency, or, that would be easily, pull, that would be an easily pulled back item, especially the way that Matt has been programming it in that we're not dedicating to spend it July 1st, the moment it's been approved, but rather we're scheduling it the following construction cycle. That does two things. Number one, it gives the town the opportunity to go, well, put the brakes on that. We need to we need to we need to hold back on that. Secondly, it also allows for um, more constructive um, timeline of your construction companies. He can get on their schedule, and we can be far more productive in that construction cycle by getting on there and starting them in the springtime. Which some applications uh, timing of that is better in the spring or uh, later in the fall than right in the middle of the heat of summer, right? So we, and we get better pricing because of that, because we can schedule well in advance and the construction companies can plan, can plan us in their schedule, right? So we've been very purposeful about that. It's a very um, succinct conversation with our credit rating agency, um, but we are running into the next two years, this upcoming year, 2024, and 2025 are likely going to be two years that we are going to have those heavy lift roads. Um, so I will say, I did ask Matt to put together, you know, we, over the course of the next five years, um, we are um, looking at that, that we're, we're planning to utilize roughly 10 million, we're planning on utilizing tw uh, $10 million, $2.5 million annually, right? So um, in order to um, deal with those heavy lift roads and still get a wider utilization, a wider, um, a wider application across town on pavement. Um, what does it mean if we were to kind of front load that? So, change it to instead of two and a half every single year. What if we were to um, front load that to um, what was it? Three point three twenty five. Yeah, three point two five. Three three million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in year one, dropping it down to two million two hundred. 75, yeah. 275,000 yeah. in year two, dropping it down in year three, and then dropping it down in year four, right? So yeah. staging it back down, that's where you're seeing on that. Uh, and so Jen's going to put that one up for me. Um, so what does that actually do, right? That's the pink line, right? So it gains us quicker because we're able to um, manage those heavier lifts like North, North Road. And I'll let Matt go through the details of North Road. I'm not even going to pretend to get all the way through that. But... Um, but it also allows us to still get to those applications that are in some of our neighborhoods that would otherwise have to be bypassed, right? Like, so there's some neighborhoods along like, uh, in like, like River Ridge and uh, some of those other, uh, the ones off of Maple Street um, that, you know, they're rough. You know, everybody, you drive down them, they're rough roads, but um, they don't have um, a higher, uh, the high traffic count, right? Um, but if you were to look at the number of houses that are on those streets compared to the number of houses that are on North Road that are gonna feel that same impact, um, it's the same number. It's a much shorter street in the neighborhoods, but North Road is a very long street and North Road needs a really heavy um, heavy lift. So this is still $10 million, just spread out differently over the same. So the ending impact on fund balance percentage is the same, right? You still land in 2028 at around 14.8 percent again using a very conservative turn back number um, from the town and the board of education into um, and assuming revenues remain roughly uh, the same as far as any other additional revenues that we have 
But um, Matt, do you want to go over North Road and the challenges around North Road? Yeah, and it's not that it's all that much harder. It's just the amount of we either break it apart to keep the cost down and keep it fair and do a little bit everywhere for everybody. But ideally, it'd be nice to do it all in one shot. That's where you get the best job. It just comes out best. And now you don't have, you're not hopping around. You're not having people, they only went so far and then they stopped. How come they didn't keep going? Um, so ideally, you would do it all in one shot. But then to be fair, to you got to make sure everybody gets a little bit of something. There is definitely something to this of you go to your through streets and all that first. But you have to pay attention to all the residents. And, and like Mary touched on, you know, you could do a neighborhood and you would actually maybe potentially lose PCI um, throughout the town if you focused on a couple of them. But at the end of the day, if you talk to residents, you'd have more people tell you my road got paved this year. So there's, you have to balance it out. You can't just solely focus on the PCI because there is the human element of it as well. They might only drive on that road for 300 yards, but they're gonna at least feel that they were noticed and that my road got paved and we're not just on a back, a back street. So that, I mean, that's something that goes into my, my plan every year, but this would help with that. This, the, if you front load it, it gives you, you're able to do North Road in one chunk, and then it allows you to explore out into more neighborhoods that maybe you don't get the, the flashy PCI boost that you would get on some other road, but you are taking care of the people that live in those, those neighborhoods, especially the way some of our neighborhoods are utilized with, you know, walking and, you know, rollerblading and, and stuff like that. Like, it, it's important to keep those healthy, too. It's not always just about how fast tra you can get through traffic through. Um, and, and this also, it gives you a little bit of flexibility of with the fund balance. It kind of front loads it where if the turn back changes, you could dial back and it, it shows that you're not putting that much of an ask as long. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a part of this was at some point, that's not gonna always be how we're gonna be able to fund this. At some point, this is probably going to have to be funded through another source. We can't just solely rely on turn back. Um, and starting to dial it down would help that transition. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be going from maybe such a high number down all of a sudden the year that we have to fund it from other sources. And it really will look like a drop. This is going to slowly take that curse out. And this gives you options where if you get a couple years and it's higher, and depending on the, the turn back, you could go a little bit more or keep it up, and then you're gonna be that much further ahead. But if you dial back down to try to match into that point where you have to kind of taper off of that, it doesn't make it so hard. So th it just, they're kind of, you end up roughly in the same PCI, and again, four or five years out, it, it's a projection. It's gonna be, you know, the way that inflation or escalation could, could go either way, or we could have roads that something happens with the amount of rain that we've had this year and we have a washout on a road that we weren't planning on for a year so then we got to bump stuff and sometimes it, it's hard because if you need to do one road you can't it's not always plug and play sometimes you have to take multiple out to get it to all work together so it is a projection I feel very confident that we're going to be around that you know without any unforeseen things that are really out there but for the most part, it's kind of just two different ways you guys you could yeah. look at it. It gives you a couple different options in either direction. Mm -hmm. And I will say from a presentation point to our credit rating agency, to see that the plan is to slowly, is to bring it down over time. They like to see that step down component um, as far as reliance on utilization. Um, so, you know, that that does help with that. But so just, just for tonight, this is just a presentation. You know, they, we're not the. There's no item for you for action from tonight on this. This is just a contemplation, as you know, we're getting ready to prepare the budget. Um, it would be great to get some feedback from here as I'm preparing the budget, but you know, one of these scenarios is likely what you're going to see within the budget. Um, you know, as we as we move forward, um, and then clearly the town, the council, and then ultimately the town makes the decision on this, right? So, um, but we wanted to start bringing this forward to you in advance to really, up number one, update you on your investment. You know, this it, it was a substantial investment that the council, you know, stepped out on that limb on. Um, and I know that that's not an easy thing to do, is to step out on that limb and do that. Um, and there, sometimes there's a lot of criticism around that, but I think um, it was well invested. 
Um, I have gotten this past year quite a few um, uh, positive comments back on on the roads um, and how they really felt that um, their roads were finally being addressed, right? Um, that there was applications out there. And, you know, it's not about just turning everyone, every one of these roads black. It's, you know, it may be a chip seal, maybe a crack seal, but they're seeing something done and they're feeling the difference in the roads. Um, you know, that's really important. So, um, so I wanted to, you know, first get that to you to, so you could see what your investment is doing, but also to just start the contemplation of where do we think we want to go with this? I think we've gotten some really good momentum on this program, um, and there's, it's still sustainable in um, what we have been doing with uh, fund balance allocation. So, um, and that will, again, all be reviewed and um, put into the uh, budget, process, budget book as well. And I, that pretty much is, that's the same way I feel. And I, I definitely want to make it clear because, like, I know I was just here two years ago and I asked for, you know, two and a half or five years. I want to make it clear that with that second option, I, I understand that's a lot of money. And I understand it's coming from taxpayers. And I'm not, I don't want anybody to think, oh, you're here and you said five years at this price, now you're asking for more. That's that's not the case. The, I, I want to stick to the plan that we made. I think it's made good progress. It was just an option that I think could give the town more flexibility. And by the town, it, I mean us as a department doing this. And I think it also gives you guys more flexibility going forward with what what goes on after the next couple of years as we kind of wind down are we going to keep that rate up or we want to start tapering down so um like mary said i wasn't really uh something that you guys have to decide tonight just to show you the two options show you that um where we're at where we're going that it it did work that um that heavy lift that you guys did make actually really did make a difference and um i, I think we were able to make a big difference this year and i hope that we can keep doing that going forward so thank you for your time on on that and yeah. Obviously. And I did want to just also say another reason why I asked for that kind of front load component is because of the rate of inflation. If there was a way we could, you know, kind of spend more on roads and less on getting impacted by inflation, inflation on outer years, um, what would that actually mean? So again, the same ten million, just kind of distributed a little differently. But yeah. if any feedback is great. Um, I just have a couple questions as far as the the ten million. Um, on the blue line, on a on a chart you handed us, yes. And, um, you would mention ten million, but if you add up, yeah, that was the one that said is the me, wrong the, the, line. Excuse me, the yeah, not the blue line, the uh, the magenta line. Yep. Um, if you add that up, it's actually eleven million. Reverse the blue and the magenta on the last one. That's a clerical error. So the the those two prices, but the colors are supposed to be swapped on twenty seven. The two point yeah. five is supposed to be blue, and the those I. The one point, the one million seven hundred and fifty yeah. is supposed to be magenta. Those are supposed to be reversed. That Those was just reversed. a yeah. yeah. All right, so that, that was a graphical error on my part. He went back and forth too many times with the colors. Well, what was happening is right at the end, the, the lines crisscross, and I ran out, yeah. and I didn't want to put it off the graph. Then I probably should have just put them off the graph. Yeah. But yep. So yeah, reverse. You're exactly right, Jason. The blue line would be two and a half, and would still be your higher PCI, and then the magenta would be the one point uh, seven five million. And was just slower at 70. So just the colors are right, and they're pointing to the right arrows. Just the numbers are wrong. So that's that's okay. my that's so my the, bad on that. So one. the magenta line would then be a total of 10 million 250 thousand. Ten hundred. If you add the 10. 10. I have the same. I have 10 million 750 thousand on the blue. On the magenta. Um, yeah. If you have the magenta, that's going to be 10 million 750 thousand. If you add the first two, the 3.25 plus the 2.75, that's 6 million. If you add, yep. okay, all right, yep. I should have put my glasses on. <laughs> so they both. But you're correct, it, was, it looked funky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 million uh, even. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it does, it looks funky. Yeah, okay. I, I, again, it's that crisscross, and I, yep. I, I tried to crisscross the numbers with it, and I just forgot to change the prices on those two, so. My apologies for that. I can get an updated one and email it to Mary so you guys have it yeah. so you can actually see it on that one. But yeah, nope, that's a 100% just graphical error. So yeah. Um, my two other questions I had. Yep. Um, if they were using the same equipment, the same process to scan the road in 22 that they had in 18, roughly where do you think 
the scan number would have yeah. ended up? I think we, I don't know if we would, now that we have two points, I don't think we would have been at the 62 we had originally planned. I think we probably would have been right around the 59 mark, I think. We still would have been low, which as much as I hate to admit that we were off, but with only having one data set, we tried to extrapolate the best we could. Um, I even utilized Alec, who worked for a company before he worked here, that did this, but their system was a little bit different. So we had his interpretation, but it was based on their ecosystem, which other towns use, and that's one of the reasons why we stuck with this company. Granted, they changed their stuff, but it was the same ecosystem. So um, now that we have two fixed points, the in-between was a lot easier to figure out as well as the projection on it. So I do feel we would have been lower than what I had originally assumed in 22, but I don't think we would have been as low. But like I said, it's, I don't, it hurts to see that low number, but I like it because I know it's, it's an accurate, accurate number. There's not, it, it's true. There's no human factor in it. It's, it's very accurate, which is good because it keeps everybody honest on stuff. Sometimes you think you're a little bit, oh, this is that and it's that. And when you see it in the data, there's, there's no way to fake it, unfortunately. Um, and my last question. So all the other numbers as far as like the 2019, 20, 21, and then yep. 23, those are all just estimates that no, nope, that was money with? that we actually spent. So no, that was um, is the PCI numbers. Oh, the PCI numbers on the, those are actual. So the, what we were able to do in between there, well, they were extrapolated between the two. So I had a, a data set at one, and what I used is roads that were, say, at a, I'll just use the exact number here. Say they were at a 67 and 18, and if we didn't touch them, and I know we didn't do any work to them, I could see where they were at. So I ran that whole data set through, and then I was able to also do stuff that I know in work that we did in 20, I knew where it was at in 18, I knew what it was recommended that that type of work would bump it up to, and then I saw where the scan brought it back down to two years later. So it kind of, it was all in a database I had, but the way it met in the middle and melded, they weren't exact, but I feel really confident in how, because I especially, the way I set it up is I had it go from both sides. So I had it go from 18 and deteriorate, then I had it go from 22 and appreciate. So it's not 100% accurate, but it definitely, that's why I didn't draw it in as a straight line either, because I wanted to show that there was a little bit of curvature in there, but it's pretty much a straight line. It's just, and I think the funding kind of shows that, so I hope that kind of answers your question on that. It's not, yeah, 100% accurate, but pretty close. Uh, 20, so 22, yeah, it was, it's, it's hard on here because I have it in December. So that war, what started in March of 22, right? Yeah, so that would have been in between. Is that what impacts paving the most? The is, that, is, that, is that the main, that the main cost driver? Probably the, the biggest one, yes. So when yeah. you look year by year, do you forecast what percentage it's going to go up to be um, X amount of, of the road year by year? There's a 2% inflation built into this. So again, it's only as good as a 2% inflation, obviously. So if so. you look at the four years, you're looking at 8%, it could be more inflation. Yep. And front loading over $3 million doing more work could possibly save money. Yeah. We yep. don't know that, but, but it could. In, in theory, it would. And the, that additional work that we would do this year would be actual paving, not some of the preventative stuff. I would use that for specifically so paving. It could be work that would be done it would get done in 25 so because we would, right, so we would vote on it for the fiscal year 24-25 budget, but because that budget becomes um, active on July 1, we're already halfway through the construction cycle. So we start it in spring of 2025 to utilize that for the whole year. And how, how far out should you, should you contract? Can you contract this every eight years? Is there a set time that you contract the road or the price that it's going to be? We do North Road. Can we contract the six months out, nine months out? You can get a price, but with the way the bids work is they're allowed an escalation clause. It has to be within a certain percentage. They yeah. can't go over, I think it's 15%, yeah. but they are allowed. But it could change by 15%. Yep. Yeah, and the, and the contractors are allowed to do that. And that's where, even though this is 25, 
to not get into the weeds too much because we're looking at doing North Road this year. This may be the one time that we take a little bit of this money if you guys do front load it and I front load it even more and I bring it after July 1, I could bring it into this construction cycle maybe to get that one done. Again, that would be a conversation I'd have with Mary and Jen and all that. It does make it a little bit more, but for the most part, this money, yeah, will be for the 2025 construction season. Mm -hmm. So, except for maybe the potential of to finish that one road out instead of splitting it. Yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges with a road like North Road is, you know, inevitably, you know, as a consumer, you're driving down the road and it's nicely paved and then all of a sudden it goes back to bumpy road and then poof, all of a sudden it's paved again. It's like, why did they stop in the middle of the road, right? Um, most people don't recognize the challenges that that one section of road may be posing and the financial constraints on that one section of road. You know, so being able to just get it all done, that's one of our, one of my methodologies, you know, and, you know, Matt's and the whole teams is our, our whole, our whole um, philosophy is Let's get in there. Let's get it done once. We want to touch it once. Let's get the drainage done. Let's get any other improvements that have to get done to that road done and paved and once and we're out. Because every time we're in there, it's disruptive to the community. It's disruptive to those individuals that are using it, right? And sometimes when you're doing stuff like that, you then have to go back and peel back some of the work you already did just to continue on, right? That's counterproductive. Um, so that's what we try and do is our methodology when we go to these roads is we start from the bottom up, right? What needs to get done first? We've done drainage at North Road. We've yep. spent a lot of time on trying to figure out that road is incredibly flat. Um, and there's not really anywhere to put water out there. It's been a very challenging component to try and figure out uh, drainage out there. But it's been a lot of work done on there. Now it's a matter of trying to get that, those sections done. And you and can't it, always start. So there are times that you have to make a decision that you're not able to start from the bottom up. And like this year, breaking North Road apart would be what we do. And we could keep it all together and do the section, but then there's not going to be a lot of notice around town elsewhere. We might still get the same PCI bump as we do going elsewhere, but then you're not going to have the same blend for all taxpayers. And that's, again, there's, there's two kind of parts to this. You have to watch your network health as it's actually – you know, tangible, but you also have to, there's the people factor too, and you got to be fair for everybody. So we try to go uh, kind of on both on those. But. How difficult would it be to come up with a rough figure as to if we were going to do all of North Road, what the cost would be? Um, I think that may be help, that may be helpful when it comes time presenting the budget so people can see, okay, well, we're spending this much, but this one road this is how much we'd have to spend on this one road. Yeah, and I can do that, and what I can kind of almost make of like a, a plan of like what that front load does, because like I said, it also, it's North Road as well as focusing on some of our, I, I don't know how else to say it, but like I don't want to say roads that have gotten pushed off or some of our side streets and neighborhoods. There's a few I have in mind that I would like to do that unfortunately trying to just gain network health, they do kind of sometimes get pushed around a little bit. So it's it's the second half of North Road and as well as three different neighborhoods that would get done with it. Three different neighborhood roads are kind of all in one, but I can get those numbers for the budget and what, what that difference will do and like I said, it's mainly going to be pretty much in paving, too, which will help with the inflation and stuff because you don't notice it as much with some of the other treatments. It still goes up because it's all, it's all oil, but um, that's the biggest one is, is actual paving. So I can, I can work on some of those numbers as well as getting you the, the correct colors on that. Yeah, where it, it makes sense. So the biggest thing, I guess, is because now the money that we allocated last year's budget, you have a full construction cycle. We weren't doing that for the longest time. It was always, here comes <coughs> May, and now we approve it. Then he has to start to get the contract. He doesn't have the funds to do it. You have not even half a construction cycle. So now, this is, this is working to our benefit, that he can contract the guys. Not, he has money. They know we have the cash. Yeah. Uh, they just didn't say it that bluntly, but th th there's money to pay for us right now, so the contractors will be willing to take the cost. 
and you're exactly right. And I noticed a little bit of a difference with that last year. And it, uh, it's all about flexibility too. Like last year with the rain that we had, we had a lot of stuff done before it really got too bad that other towns were getting pushed out and they had already been to our town two or three times. So like that was great. We had some that got bumped out, but it was good. Um, another thing with, with that is say something, uh, not to ever do the same, but with what happened with COVID in 2020, if something that dramatic happened, I have a year already kind of, I don't want to say stashed, but we have a year where if we cut a little bit, we still have, we can do something. We're not pausing for the year. And and that's, again, the front load builds a little bit of more of, it, of that in, as well as like the funding with, again, depending on what happens with the turn back, if that starts to change, you kind of used it up while you had it there is is the theory on on that. So again, I think it's just all about flexibility and it does help a lot to and have it a year ahead of time. And to your, to your point as well, um, with scheduling, there are times that we can get sometimes a little bit of a price break because we can keep a contractor busy in town. So you're not paying as much uh, redeployment costs because they know that we can, you know, we can do a good chunk or they can go from this road to that road over there and they can time it out and they can be in town for a couple of weeks before they got to come back, right? So we can give them enough work to keep them busy, which does help in having to not have to constantly be paying those additional redeployment costs. And, and one thing too is it doesn't show it on here and it might get into the weeds, but in 2023, we had uh, spent total of 2.6 million. Originally when we went into the year, I think I had for prices 2.2 planned and then that extra 400,000 was our that was to cover if there was escalation which there wasn't this year which was good and two that allowed me towards the end of the season as contractors had stuff available I added on stuff that would have been for this season coming up that we had of like if we have the opening and there's not a lot of escalation like we have some roads almost like ready to go to like kick off the bench a year earlier and um and if not and if it timing doesn't work out say the contractors can't make it or the weather it then the next year there's a little bit more for the next year but at the same time where at that way not like what had to happen in between 21 and 22 where we had to cut a road off that could happen at times but i don't really want to do that if we make a plan i'd like to at least get through that plan and um, these numbers are kind of built in with that there's again they're they're built in with that figure in there every year is a little bit different on how much that cushion is and as we go forward and get more data we'll be able to fine-tune that that buffer to make it make sense because um, you don't want to have too big of a buffer and not plan enough work and at the end of the year you're trying to fill it all in but you don't want to have too much where I'm dipping into the next granted it wouldn't be till September so we would have had the money available from July but now you're taking away from the next year so again it's all about flexibility that's one thing I've noticed really seems to make the most the most difference Yeah. And the situation was, was such as that, again, that was a few years ago, but now we have a little more flexibility, but still, to, to be taken on the North Road, I think we've got to do, spend the time and finish it right off. And then everybody's there, they're on the same boat, and, you know, pull you back again, that's when I hear it. Yeah. The other things I I don't hear that, oh, paving is great. What I hear is, we need police here, they're, they're speeding too much. That's what I get on a, on a positive, that's a negative to say positive. They don't say, yeah. The Matt can always put the sign back out. <laughs> no, Fe Federal Highway said that no more doing that. Oh. They said, uh, they, the actual Federal Highway Administration just came out recently and kind of said no more funny, funny road traffic signs. They put a kibosh. We had put a sign when we initially put the digital sign out to remind everybody that Maple Street was still um, uh 30, 30 miles per hour, Matt had put um, uh, new road, same speed limit. If you don't, don't we'll comply, put we'll put the or we'll put the bumps back <laughs> on the digital sign. It was only up there for a week. And I think, then we, I think it we was took like it down. A weekend or yeah, whatever. it was a weekend yeah. or something. It was we a very short period of time, yeah. but it was it was kind of it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm and sure they went they fast do. before we paved that road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
there is that one negative sometimes to this, that, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, more, more speak the same way. More speak the same way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I almost said smack back in on your driver left. But like I said, either way, I, I, I think I just, I'm glad to show this to you guys that it, it did, um, it did make a difference, or I feel it did, and just something to kind of mull over as you guys go forward. Um, I have one other request. Um, when you're throwing the numbers together for North Road, um, can you also put numbers together if we were to do half one year, half the next year, um, to show how much more cost there would be? Because I'm assuming if you're doing half now, half later, yeah. so that way we can see savings to doing it all at once as opposed to splitting it between two years. Yeah, I can. I mean, that's kind of built into the blue line because that's currently kind of what the plan is. So it's hard to necessarily show. I could try to do it because you're going to – we don't know what the prices are. And, and they do – sometimes asphalt does drop. So, again, we're using our 2% inflation. So I could get you the price of what I plan for it to be the front half this year and then next year what I'm using for an estimation. Um, I can put it in as a savings. It's probably – it will be a savings. It might not be – I hate to say this because I don't want to talk you out of it, but like it might not be a huge, huge savings, but I can get those numbers in there just so you can see. But it's kind of built into the blue line. That's built into the blue line already, sort of, of splitting it up because that's kind of what I decided that we're going to do. Right. We'll have to walk through that and look at yeah. what the impact would be to also having to remove the other roads. I think the biggest thing is if you do North Road in one shot this year, what it does, it would more so be what you would see on the map on the front page, what it takes away from everywhere else. I think that's the bigger story. So you either deal with it being split in half and then covering everything, or <coughs> you do that one section and you'll see all the color go off the map that is roads that would have got touched. I feel like that could be the bigger. I can try to work some things out and I'll go with Mary what makes sense. Yeah, we'll, we'll so. run through those scenarios and then we can get you some yeah. information. Well, like, like you tell me when I talk to you, don't promise anybody anything. Yeah. Because I, I, and I won't. I mean, you know, maybe I'm a bit, but I have to be careful when I'm talking about it because I don't want, I can't commit at that time. Who knows what he has, and then when, when something goes south, that's a whole different story. But maybe we got to bite the bullet. I, I don't know. We got to take the North Road gets to put the helmets back a little bit, and then next year we get those. I, we got to take the the most as economical as we can with the, you know, with the most bang for our buck. I mean, uh, if it works out, you know. Are the PCI numbers supposed to be transposed as well on the last? The last for the. Last the segment? Do you should mean? The blue, should the blue be? Um, I'm just curious. No, so the blue. The, why the magenta is less. That for front loading, why the magenta is less than the blue. That's how the deterioration curve works. I mean, they're within a half a point, so but you'll get what that. What you're doing in 2024 is going to deteriorate, so that brings it down less, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep, it does change, and that's what's hard with projecting that far out for a half a PCI point. It's, it is less, but that's why I wanted to show it does crisscross. Like, yeah, you can front load and you get a little bit more up front, but then as you drop off, you are dropping off a little bit at the end. And that's where you go because you're going to start focusing on, at that point, you get maybe some more of your through roads or years of focusing on your neighborhoods, like I said, that aren't as flashy when it comes to what they turn into <coughs> on the PCI score. But you have to kind of do that. Because there's a way that we could go through and almost do all of our neighborhoods this year, and then we drop right back down, unfortunately. So there's a balance act to that. And this kind of shows that because it front loads north road, um, it also has a little bit to do with Bailey Hill in the next, the next year, a little bit more focus on Bailey Hill as a through road in the second year. And then that, unfortunately, the flip side of that is you do end up with a little bit of a drop as a network hole right, once you have the it at start. The sooner you put it in, the sooner the, it starts the wear starts. To, correct, yeah. yep. So, I mean, at that point, with a half a point, I feel like pretty confident at four years out, that's, it's going to be close to each other. Um, I think that's almost a negligible difference at that point, this far out, but you're correct. It is it is lower. They do cross. So I just had a couple questions uh, for Mary, really, to make sure I understand the process. So you were throwing out a, a lot of money uh, numbers, 22.25% um, uh, fund balance, and then 15% fund balance if we got 450000 back. 
we're talking about uh, 24 to 25 year now. Is there still money caught up in litigation for 2023, 24? Um, yes, so we are, st well, we're still in mediation um, for one of our tax appeals. Um, and, you know, clearly, um, you know, hope I will be going, I actually Monday have a mediation session on that. So yes, that is still, um, you know, possible for utilization down the road. Um, we've been utilizing for this program, we've been focusing on, you know, part of this, part of this funding is built already into the tax rate. Part of this funding has been leveraged by utilizing fund balance. Um, and that's been a successful use of fund balance. So uh, these numbers with the 22% and the 15%, mm -hmm. that's is that in that equation somewhere? Yeah, so that's yeah. all based on what our fund balance percentage is to our overall operating right. budget. I, I'm talking about the, the litigation uh, money that's coming. It, where does so that play into that? That we had already, in the current year's budget, we had allocated that to capital, so the additional a revenue that would have been generated by that um, by that tax uh, bill. Um, what we what was the potential exposure in litigation was was allocated to capital in the capital improvement plan, and um, had other capital items that it was um, attributed to. So um, it's not it wouldn't be reflected in the general fund fund balance because it was transferred already to. It's currently sitting in a reserve and pending the end of this, nope. the ending that, of that. But it's actually in capital, capital is fund. It in part of this. It capital? is not for this. Okay, not awesome. for this. Thank you. <clears throat> so, the, do these numbers um, are they including the town aid road contribution, or is that up and above from that? Which they isn't are, a much. And you don't know what that contribution is year to year, but that's. It's been pretty consistent, but that um, that is not built into this. A lot of times, like this last year, the 2.6, some of that, because it was 2.5, that was included in there, as well as some of the the monies that we get for when you, contractors work in a road, and then we say we'll take the in lieu of price instead of uh, making them do that. So that kind of, a lot of times, we'll use that as the buffer, but Mary and I and, and Dave Cap as well have talked about our plan for that going forward is this will be to maintain our network and that will be stuff that will be for like really redoing a road like that would be for like what Reynolds, Reynolds Street granted is ARPA money what's happening on Reynolds Street mm -hmm. now but that would be a perfect example of like more when there's more to town it would be more to the road than just repaving it like say we want to widen it take a corner out sidewalks. put a sidewalks and stuff like that that's our goal for it so I don't want to include that in here because we want to use that for some more of those like bigger projects that change the road other than just resurfacing it. So that's kind of our, our thought process on it. Until we get to that point, we can utilize it in here, but I don't have that built in for that specific reason. So we can start using that for, um, and even in some of our neighborhoods, like I don't, some of you guys might remember, Ed, I know you do, a couple years ago was Maryland Street, and what that took for uh, drainage infiltration because we had nowhere else to put it. But that's one of, many roads in that, that neighborhood that all have the same thing. So that would be money that we would utilize for something like that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would definitely put a big hit on this for something like that. So we want to try to kind of keep those separate for like two different goals. Um, so kind of long answer there, right. but that's okay. what our and, plan is. And Town Aid Road can, is also going to be used for guide rails. Um, and we have a lot of aging guide rail infrastructure that we are going to need to address and guide rail is expensive that goes very short run can go for a lot of money so um you know town aid to road we only we we do get a couple hundred thousand dollars for town aid road but when you're looking at sidewalk work guide rails and drainage that pretty much will use up and um that's why he doesn't necessarily have it layered into this all right thank you any further questions comments thank you again guys sure thank you We'll now move on on the agenda. Next item up is 6G presentation of proposed solid waste fund for fiscal year 2025. So um, I have Dave Cap coming. You have nothing in your folders for this. You don't have any any documentation in this. This is really to update you on the conversation 
solid waste sub subcommittee had, um, what you're going to be starting to see coming forward in the budget book. So the budget and the um, the documents we rated related to solid waste sub solid waste fund comes to you during the budget process. But I know that they've had a lot of conversations about uh, potential rate increases. So this was an opportunity for Dave to just come and talk through what some of those uh, uh, recommendations have been by the Solid Waste Subcommittee um, in preparation for you to be able to see that um, coming forward into the budget process. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good evening, all. How's everybody doing on this wonderful night? <laughs> Okay, um, I, as Mary said, I really don't have a presentation uh, for you, but I'll just go over what we discussed at the last Solid Waste Subcommittee meeting as far as uh, proposed changes to the fees. Um, it was proposed to change the uh, three-trip pass uh, to increase it $10 and uh, a $15 permit fee um, with seniors would remain the same at $40, and it would go from uh, 80 to $95 for a year-long permit, uh, with a $1 increase from sticker in uh, stickers for the garbage bags, which is a 35-gallon uh, bag currently. The stickers currently are $5, and would go to 6 And an increase on residential tires of $2 for disposal of the tires and a $5 increase for agriculture and equipment tires, and a bulk waste fee uh, increase from $0.10 cents a pound to $0.15 cents a pound. Um, so, and it was also proposed to do a uh, reduction in the general fund subsidy, and that's uh, what these rates would offset. So that reduction would go from, right now we're currently, the general fund is subsidizing the solid waste fund by 234000 mm -hmm. and that would essentially just about cut it in half. That would reduce it to about 121,000, I think, off the top of my head. Yeah, about 130. 130,000. Yeah. Um, so a substantial reduction in what the general fund subsidy would be. Um, I know the Solid Waste Subcommittee was working on trying to better align user rates with user cost. Um, you know, the the general fund has been subsidizing, and most general funds. You know, if I I've looked across many municipalities. Transfer stations are never self-sufficient. Um, they are very costly endeavors. Um, and so um, generally they're subsidized by the general fund in some way, by general tax base in some way. But this has been a conversation that the town council's had in many a budget season of how can the general fund subsidize this less. Um, and so that was really the recommendation that they're gonna be putting forward. That's what we're layering into the budget um, that's going to come before you um, for, uh, you know, for consideration in April. So, um, you know, it does provide some of that um, relief to the general fund. It does shift some of those costs onto the users of the facility. Um, and, you know, that, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, a balance. It's, a, it's truly a balance to be had with that, you know. Every time we go through this, is it, you know, by increasing the rates, is it going to cause people to, you know, are we going to start finding a lot more trash on the sides of the road? That's been a high concern, right? Um, but, you know, costs have gone up. And the last time the rates were increased was when, Dave, do you remember oh, the call? 2017? Yeah, it's been quite a number of years. And as we all know, that those of us that have private haulers, rates have definitely gone up several times in the last um, number of years. Uh, so... You know, I think it's probably due time for that um, increase to occur. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what the Solid Waste Subcommittee really is going to be bringing full. We're, we're developing that into the budget to bring forward as the recommendation. Um, so, uh, This might be coming in the budget. I don't know. But could we get a synopsis unless you want to do it all again? I got about three quarters of that. Oh. I will do a synopsis in the budget. Um, again, you know, this was kind of trying to be more of a dialogue, um, just as a you know verbal update of everybody. But yes, I will be providing that in the budgetary document to be able to outline exactly what those rate increases will be. The town council, because it is a rate increase, um, the town council will like will also need to hold a separate 
um, public hearing for those rate increases and then ultimately adopt those rate increases um, further on down the road as we get down the line. But yes, Michelle, I, I will definitely provide that. You don't need to scribble it all down. I'm sorry. Um, we were trying to get this all pulled together um, for tonight. But um, uh, so yes, that's just to kind of give you guys that feedback. I do have one question. Um, as far as having to increase the rates and having to go have the meet, have the public meeting about it. Um, are we going to be doing that before the budget process? So that way when we're in the budget process, we can factor in how much the subsidy is going to be um, or you do the, so just as the WPCA does, um, you will do the public hearing and set the rates after the budget has been completed because then you will know what your subsidy is from the general government. Okay. So the general government budget needs to pass first, and then you set your final rates afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Well, Grandowski. So all across the board, you know, all across the board, waste disposal is just going sky high. So if we didn't raise the rates at the transfer station, that's kind of setting it that, okay, we can go over there. So let everybody see there are costs associated with it. There's all kinds of moves to put. They want to take food waste out. There's uh, biodegradable stuff. There's all kind of proposals that they're trying to get the waste stream down, but it all comes to non-contamination of everything else. You're, what you're trying to save and take out, even recyclables, is we're paying now, what, $80 a ton to get rid of recyclables, where before we used to make something on it. Yeah, but almost, it's, almost 82 a ton now. And, we used to but get 25 a ton is, is for the it. biggest thing. Well, I think we made a big mistake when we went to single stream a few years ago. We had separate, and they were clean. Now there's no way to go back that to what that was. But so this is an attempt, and you know, people see it. So by cutting the subsidy in half, by raising the rates, that'll make up that difference. Well, yes. no. provided it, <laughs> provided the uh, use of the transfer station remains the same. Exactly. So if, the if, the, if the use of the transfer station yeah, okay. reduces because of the rate increase, um, that will <laughs> certainly, we will have to dispose of less, but our operating costs will remain the same. Correct. You know, I saw these numbers already somewhere this week. How many, how many people have a pass? Currently, you are averaging from year to year uh, somewhere between 780 790 800 a year 800 households yeah yeah, household. yeah. Household. so it's about 18 percent of the pop of the residential population that utilizes the transfer station yeah. yep that's uh so it's and we are not um the solid waste sub subcommittee uh, did not want to budget in, I believe, for hazardous waste disposal Correct. for this year. So mm -hmm. that'll be this will be a pass year on that. We won't be doing a household hazardous waste collection um, planned for for this upcoming year. Um, and we typically try and hold those at least every other year because you know people tend to not want to hold on to that kind of stuff. And I will say from a regional perspective, I know NECOG has continued to try and go for funding for a regional household hazardous waste disposal facility. Um, they haven't received grant funding for that, but that is something that has been a priority regional initiative um, for a few years now. So hopefully they'll be able to get some funding around that um, to make that happen. Because we are one of the few regions that doesn't have a facility that people can bring, the, bring hazard, household hazardous waste to. Um, and they have to instead rely on these pop-up events that occur by individual towns. So even if like Brooklyn is holding it, it's not like people from Killingly can go to Brooklyn, right? And it's, you know, and vice versa. It's, unless we're jointly holding it together, um, then it's really by, you know, it's the residents that are within that town that get to use it. So it does make it far more challenging in the Northeast corner to actually dispose of household, household hazardous waste more so than in other parts of the state of Connecticut because other parts of the state of Connecticut are in they have facilities that they are in uh, regional co-ops with. Have we explored doing a 
joint venture with surrounding towns for hazardous waste? Oh, we've done them before. Okay. We have, um, and it and it and it has worked out. You know, we've um, we've done joint with um, uh, Brooklyn, I believe, at one point in time, and I don't remember if we did one with Putnam or Pomfret, but mm-hmm. we've we've looked at them before. Um, we tend to have a lot of people that respond, so they uh, do tend to come to us. But really, what happens is is they identify what waste is being disposed by which town so we we save on advertising costs but you know they don't it's not like we go oh we had all you know 90 percent of the people were killing lee brooklyn you're going to pay half the bill right that that's not how that works right everybody tries to identify essentially which town is getting what so we end up saving on deployment costs and advertising costs right and we try and do it together i i've done them jointly when i was in putnam as well um you know and it can work um, but again, usually the host town has the higher um, turnout than the than the partnering town. Well, usually, people don't like to drive too far to bring their hazardous waste or paint or whatever the case may be. Right, their old gasoline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Any other questions, Keep comment? Seeing none. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dave. Okay, thank you all. Have a nice evening. You too. You're welcome. And we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is seven unfinished business for town meeting action. We have none, so we'll move on to item eight citizen statements and petitions. Ms. Glory, did we have anything submitted? We had uh, two submitted. The first one was from Jennifer Thompson, um, and she submitted um, a comment with regards to the condition of Blueville Mill. Um, the second comment that we received was from Norm Farron. Um, and he submitted a comment um, concerned about the um, process of the Board of Education. And those were the only two comments that we received. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll open up for public comment. Anyone would like to make public comment, uh, please state your name and address. I don't think it is. Jen, podium. (coughs) Sorry. Okay, this is a message I'm reading via email from Jennifer Thomas. Uh, To the town of Killingly Manager Mary Calario, hello, I'm writing to you about the Balleville Mill that has been burned down and fenced but remains an eyesore as well as causing the neighborhood to go down in tax revenue due to blight. I don't want this spot to continue in the same direction as the Bailey Hill Road Mill, that of total blight and a loss of tax revenue for about 10 years now. Due to the mill and the derelict homes surrounding that area, I have written Kevin Catula and Michelle Murphy on this matter as well. I am hoping for a very strong response from our town council and town ordinance personnel. Please, please feel free to share this email with the council at large. I have retired recently, so I have time, and I will feel free to use it for getting this worked out. Thank you, taxpayer Jennifer Thomas. Thank you. Any other public comment? Last call for public comment. Seeing no more public comment, we'll move on. Next item up is item nine, council and staff comments. Sure, with regards to um, <clears throat> Ms. Thompson's comment with regards to Blueville Mill, um, I've given pretty regular updates to the town council. Um, you know, that is definitely a complex situation. Um, we do have active engagement from EPA. Um, they've, you know, been out recently to check the monitoring wells. They um, have been in contact with the property owner, um, and they are taking their actions. But I, you know, I realize that in, you know, in the neighborhood and in front of everyone's faces, it seems like nothing's happening. Um, Jill is in contact with EPA on both this this mill, um, Bailey Hill Mill. Um, once or twice a week trying to determine what their next steps are and how they might be able to move forward. Um, So the next steps is to get um, their um, emergency enforcement action to um, be able to come in and retest the entire site. That's the first thing that has to happen. 
Um, they have to retest it and determine what the hazardous material levels are, what is the hazards, and what is a disposal plan for the remaining uh, rubble that's on the site. Um, I've been very uh, loudly, loudly advocating for the state to take uh, a very active role in this. As a matter of fact, when I was at the um, uh, Council of Small Town Convention um, a week and a half ago, the governor was there. That was my question to him was um, how can the state um, assist towns, especially small towns, in managing these uh, derelicted uh, mill properties that are Brown's fields that we need to, um, towns can't do the lift on this. Um, and his response was the state was going to step in and help. So I'm getting that on a recording. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm going after it. I am, because the state has to step in. We, you know, the towns, we don't have the financial resources and the, uh, to be able to do this lift. We don't have the teeth on the environmental side to, um, to remediate these. Um, and really, that's where we need to go. You know, Bailey Hill Mill, that was five years ago. That was, that was week two of my employment here as the town manager. So I, I very freshly remember that, that that morning I sat here and gave a budget presentation after being out at Bailey Hill since 11 o'clock the, the night before. I very, very much remember Bailey Hill Mill. Um, and again, um, having EPA activated on that one and having DEEP involved in that one, uh, that one is also uh, has another level of challenge in that it has an active building that is over an active spillway which you have to you know one of the challenges that we had five years ago on that was um, that they didn't want to have debris and contaminants fall into the waterway as that was being uh, removed that's still a challenge today it is crumbling it is falling in at this moment um, I was just out there a month ago and um, looking at those conditions and I understand that I understand their frustration. I have the same level of frustration on the on the snail's pace that this takes. But um, I will say that um, Jill is very focused on these, um, and um, I'm very focused on these. On and every time I can get in front of a legislature, the governor, whomever it is, EPA, I will advocate. I will bring them to every single all three of them all three of those properties. We have like a triangle tour that if you're in town, you're you're making your you're making our loop, because um, we feel the more they see it, the more it's in front of them, the more they see truly how they're situated in the neighborhoods and the true direct impact to the neighbors, um, really gets the momentum. And so I think right now we have some good momentum with EPA. So I know it doesn't mean that it's getting cleaned up tomorrow, but uh, you know we are working very hard. Um, on the avenues that we can to get those moved. Thank you. Um, so as far as town council taking any action on this, because of the fact these are private properties, um, it isn't like the town council can go in and no. Right, no. do anything. Yeah, there's not really any. And I will say, if I thought that there was action that was going to help spur this forward for the town council to do, to do I would have been in front of you day one to say this is an action but I will say you know as we you know as you interact with legislatures as you interact with you know representatives or senators um, and they're talking about brown browns fields remind them you know um, help be a voice in that way um, that's the way that we get the attention you know and killingly for the first time is one of one of only a couple um, award grantees of an EPA grant. That, that was our first time around. We truly have the eyes of EPA at this point in time. Um, so that I think is going to definitely help us move forward. They have a committed vested interest at this point in time. So um, that I think is going to help us um, move forward. But what you can do is help add voice to this. Um, if you're in front of a legislator or you're in front of you know anybody DEEP, EPA, any of those environmental agencies, talk about it. Talk about the neighborhood it impacts. Talk about how this is really impacting the people that have to look at it out their kitchen windows or the kids that see it every day before they get on the bus. We have to talk about it because otherwise it becomes, oh, it's just another mill. And we, we talk about these mills all over the state, right? But when you can put that personal 
acknowledgement of the impact on it to them, it puts it adds a, added layers of perspective to that, and I think they engage uh, more readily. Thank you. Any other comments? We can also we know how to contact them. All we can all email them. Yep. If we if each one of us emails them once a week, uh, that'll be getting. Yep. You know, one person designate one person a week to email someone, then you're not uh, <laughs> lighten the load for we can all. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the more the more uh, communication and voice and advocacy they receive, um, the more um, more attention we have. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is 10A, appointments to boards and commissions. Vance Carter is seeking reappointment to the Board of Rec. He's seeking reappointment as a regular member his term would run from January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2026. Mr. Carter's attendance over the course of his appointment has been consistent with only one absence in 2022. Board of Eric Rec currently has no vacancies. Uh, can I get a motion to reappoint Mr. Carter? I'll make a motion to reappoint Mr. Carter. A motion has been made by Mr. Catula, second by Ms. Barclay. Uh, discussion, comments? Mr. Grandelsky. Well, we she was very enthusiastic. She was engaged. That's what we want. We want to continue going on. And uh, that's what she said. Thank you. And it's nice that this is full. I mean, we have other yeah. boards and commissions that aren't. So, um, you know, when people are enjoying themselves being on it, that, that, that's a plus. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to the agenda. Next item up is 10B. Mary Ann Schramm is seeking appointment to the Agriculture Commission. There is currently one regular vacancy and three alternate member vacancies. She is looking to be appointed as a regular member. Her term would run from November 1st, 2021 through October 31st of 2024. Uh, can I get a motion to appoint uh, Ms. Schramm? Second. Motion has been made by Ms. Barclay, seconded by Mr. Gambatista. Uh, discussion? Same, uh, she was enthusiastic. Uh, we were canceled this month because there wasn't enough for a quorum, so I think any added juice into that commission would be wonderful. Thank you. And it's nice to see a new member of the community step forward again. I agree. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to the agenda. Next item up is 11A, Board of Education Liaison, which I do not see the Board of Ed Liaison. So we'll move on to 11B, Borough Council Liaison. And he is not here this evening either. So move on to item 12A, discussion and acceptance of monthly budget reports. Summary report on general fund appropriations for town government. Uh, can I get a motion to accept this? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Uh, questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on, 12B, system object based on adjusted budget for the Board of Education, and we have none. Their um, finance manager has been out ill, so um, they weren't able to uh, provide that. Thank you. And we'll move on I further. Don't oh. they have the assistant? Um, She's been working on audit close. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to 13A, Town Manager's Report. Um, so uh, thank you. The first um, item on there is what the governor has issued for his proposed uh, state budget. 
um, adjustments. So this is the second year of, of the biennial budget. So we really only uh, usually see um, adjustments at this point in time to what was originally um, approved the prior legislative cycle. So um, minor adjustments, um, we end up actually in a positive with regards to um, the pilot. Just a few notes on here. One, um, the ECS amount that you see here um, is not going to be the same amount that you're going to see in the budget. And that is because, so educational cost sharing, because Killingly is an alliance district, the state froze our funding at our 2012 levels. So on the amount that can be utilized in the budget has been frozen since 2012. Mm -hmm. We've not gotten any additional funding that can be used in the budget process uh, since 2012. Any additional funding that is uh, allocated to Killingly in the, in the budgetary process is all considered alliance grant funding. That goes directly to the district. It cannot be used to supplant the budget, and it has to be used for programming to improve the performance of the school district. So um, I have been advocating very loudly um, to our legislators, um, and every year we talk about ECS, about how, how, so the Alliance districts are your 33 lowest performing school districts in the state of Connecticut as of 2012. They have not reevaluated those to determine if any of them have improved to a point of being released from that Alliance district. Um, so with that, um, I've been you know, advocating loudly that in 12 years, there has been substantial inflationary costs, cost of living increases over the years that your um, communities are bearing the full cost of. The state is not participating in those because they have frozen our funding at the 2012 levels. Um, and you know, I'm, uh, the, I'm the treasurer for the uh, Conference of Small, Small Towns. We just recently had a meeting and a legislative meeting. Um, you know, that's of the small towns, so these are towns that are under 35,000 in population, um, half of these 33 towns are those small towns, right? Um, towns that can't afford to, you know, uh, fund all of this burden, right? And, um, and the state's not picking up any additional funding. So I continually put that in front of our legislators. Remember, it seems like something that, you know, they very quickly glaze over and forget about. And then when you bring it back up the next year, they're like, really? And I'm like, yes, it's been 12 years. So um, I continue to advocate on that. That's my soapbox. Um, and I hope, you know, this year the governor actually on ECS funding um, killingly didn't get impacted because we're an alliance district. And they say, well, you didn't get impacted because you're alliance district. But um, he did decrease overall ECS funding to all of the districts um, and put, took some of that, took that money and put it into early childhood education funding. So legislators are going to be talking about ECS funding this legislative cycle because they are going to be trying to figure out how to fund early childhood education and maintain ECS funding to the districts. So this is where I'm trying to also utilize the knowledge of your, your alliance districts have also been underfunded for the last 12 years. So um, they're going to be trying to balance that. Um, the other thing that I want to also just you know, uh, mention as we go through the budgetary process, yes, the governor's budget does reflect the Mohegan Pequot grant. Currently, Killingly is still ineligible for that. So we did remove that from revenue and the, in the, in the um, operating budget. I will be building the budget for the upcoming year with a zero for that. But sometimes people will look at the governor's budget and say, but why isn't this revenue, you know, we have this revenue, why isn't it there? So just know that it is rec it, it is identified in the governor's budget, but I, we know that right now Killingly is not eligible for it. So largely, um, you know, for the most part, we're staying fairly level um, with our overall state funding. And that's Good news coming into the upcoming budget year. We've had, uh, I've had times when the governor's budget has come out and there's been substantial reductions in, in revenue. So um, overall, um, a, a fairly good start. Um, the next thing, website redesign, that's something we've been talking about for some time. I did give you an update back in December or November that we were um, evaluating platforms. Um, we did identify um, the platform um, Revise, they were um, 
they have a really great municipal platform. They understand the complexities of the information that needs to be housed within municipal website. They are ADA compliant, um, so they're also responsive on a mobile device. Um, and uh, one of the things that we, uh, I gave you some information about this, uh, this um, system, um, but they, um, we wanna be able to incorporate community input and as we're developing this a website design. So you'll see that there's a link in my um, manager report for a survey. Um, I've printed out the copy of the survey um, for people to fill out. We wanna know how people are engaging with our website. What are the most important things that you go to the website for? What do we need on the front landing page? What do we need? Um, and it's maybe seasonal, right? Maybe there's certain things that are super important at one time of the year and other things that are important at other times of the year. We're trying to get that feedback. So this is gonna really be, we're gonna spend some time really trying to gather that information. We're gonna be posting that link on our Facebook page. If you can please share that widely, fill it out yourself. So that way we can get your input on how um, people are interacting with our website and what are they looking for on our website so we can be responsive to that. Um, the, re the redesign cost is just a little over 11000 for the entire, but by going to this platform, they also have part of this platform that's already established in there, in there we don't have to pay additional for it, is a, um, is a, uh, a similar platform to what we have right now, which is C-Click Fix, which is where you can go in and you can take a picture of like a pothole on the road and say, there's a pothole here or town, are you gonna fix it? And we can distribute it among um, the staff so that way it goes to the right department. They have that built into this. So we would no longer have to subscribe to C-Click Fix um, and that's a savings of $5,200 a year. Um, by us not having to have that and having that incorporated in our website without having to have a separate module. One of the challenges that we found with C-Click Fix is that when you go to the C-Click Fix, it's a completely separate website. People start, you know, I think everybody gets a little leery. I thought I was on Killingly. Now I'm over in this other weird website. I don't know what this is. Is it really going to get to where it needs to be? Um, so um, that um, that is moving forward. Um, but we are expecting, you know, um, there where this is funded through the IT reserve, so there's no requirement for any additional funding. Um, that every year our IT re, IT reserve is funded through the general government budget, and we reserve funds for things just like this: software up, major software upgrades, um, or um, and our hardware upgrades that we do. We have our hardware on a very specific. Um, replacement cycle um, to minimize any um, challenges around uh, outdated and outdated. Um, our audit, we're still in process with our audit. Um, I will say that I was, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% positive that they will be presenting to you at your March meeting. Um, our auditors, our primary one on the audit, um, did it has had to go out on a leave of absence so they are trying to you know finalize that their uh, other staff is finishing up um, other audits so we're trying to work through that process but uh, Jen's been uh, in regular communication with them um, even over the weekends so good for Jen <laughs> but um, she's hard pushing to get that done because we are getting ready to go into a debt issuance um, so we do need to have that audit issued for the debt for us to be able to go through that credit rating call. Um, transparency software, I don't want you to think that we let this go off the radar. We have not. Um, but I did prioritize the audit over the impl the final implementation. They did when they ran the, um, the mapping. They did find, as finance was reviewing it, they did find some mapping errors that they had to get corrected. They were going back through that remapping phase and um, we got under crunch time of crunch, crunch time of the audit, and I needed to prioritize the finance staff to the um, audit um, because we need to issue debt. So um, the transparency software, we're hoping to still get that rolled out um, sometimes, sometime likely later in March, right after the audit is completed. But um, I fully will let you know that I did prioritize the audit over that. Um, not something I wanted to do, but given 
the implications of um, needing to get the audit in in order for our debt issuance. That was important, but we do have this as a high priority of getting completed and active on our website before budget process. So that way the townspeople will be able to interact with it through the budget process. Um, library program. We have the giant room. I know that some of you guys are aware of that. We have the giant room that came out in um, November, so uh, in October, sorry, right at Halloween. It was the same day as Spooktacular. Um, it was a very, so the giant room is um, an organization, a program that is actually run out of New York City. Um, they um, uh, will sometimes go on other locations and other places. Um, and so it's essentially, um, they basically provide a gajillion things for craft and building opportunity, and they give it a theme and the kids build whatever. And what they did was they took those, so the fir their, their theme was, I used to be afraid. And the kids created, there's pictures of all of our kids, and they created what they used to be afraid of. And they made a whole book based on what our kids used to be afraid of, right? So you have ghosts and bats and you have all sorts of things and they colored it. And all of the kids' names, that part every participant, <laughs> child or adult, um, is all listed in the back of the book. So they created a book out of it. And then they took all of their creations and did a 3D imaging of it. And they created a Find It book um, out of that. And so where's my monster? And then they get the kids can go and find, you can find all their monsters. So um, I've purchased a set of these. Um, if any of you would like a set, I have plenty of sets here. You are more than welcome to take them. Um, and sh you know, just show them around. But this was this was a free program. We didn't have to pay for this program. This was an amazing program. We had about uh, 60 participants that participated in this program, and um, they're coordinating to come back, which is awesome. So um, I, I just I think this is great. We've actually I created a little shadow box and put them in because I just want to celebrate. This is just so really cool. Um, to you know, have our kids make something in their library and then see it published in an actual book. And you can buy these books off of their website and everything. But um, and then they, they took them and they and they truly, you know, they digitized them and they turned them into little 3D things, 3D monsters. And then you get to find it in a Find It book. Um, that's just super cool. And I just wanted to highlight this as one of the programs and the outreaches, you know, Claudette submitted the Killingly Public Library into the program for consideration, you know, kind of as a maybe we'll get it. And then they called and they said, well, we can do this day. And it was like, I'll make that happen. I'll make it happen. It was the same day as Spooktacular. And, you know, there was a lot going on in town that day. Um, and they made it happen. And because it was so successful, we're likely going to be able to get them to come back and do another program. So keep your eyes out for that. But um, if anybody wants a, a copy of these books, please feel free to take them. I purchased them, so that way anybody would want them, they can take them. We're kind of sharing them around. So um, just to celebrate our, our library. Um, two other things that I have um, that I did not have in my manager's report. Um, <clears throat> part one of, both, one of them I forgot to put in the report, and I should have. Um, so park trees. Um, Every, all the time, we are constantly evaluating the trees within our parks. There's two trees at Owen Bell that I believe they actually got taken down today. So you may have people that reach out to you about these two trees. They were posted for 10 days, so we had notices on them. I did get one individual that reached out to me very concerned about us taking these down. So these are two trees that are right at the edge of the parking lot. They're in between the parking lot and the splash pad or the, or the, um, or the playground. Um, they're the two, the two closest to the splash pad. Um, so, you know, we enjoy the beauty of our trees in our parks. We want to keep them and sustain them. However, those two trees were uh, becoming severely damaged. Um, number one, um, the root compression from the uh, parking lot and the heat radiation from that parking lot was damaging the roots on that one, on one side. The other side, there's been a significant amount of erosion. So the topography of the land right there, it goes steeper the closer you get to the splash pad. Um, as we've in, since we've installed the splash pad, of course everybody wants to sit under the trees, which is great, but the grass hasn't been able to grow, and that's further eroded, which has exposed a lot of the root 
base and that has provide that has damaged those trees coupled with they have had some significant infiltration of disease um, so the end one closest to the splash pad we were actually starting to see visible signs of um, decay and, and dropping of limbs from the interior limbs, um, that becomes a high concern for me. Um, people are going to potentially be underneath these trees. Um, you know, tree limbs, when they decide to go, you don't always necessarily know when they're going to go. So um, we did have to take down those two trees. It's very unfortunate, but that's what had to happen. Um, we are planning on looking at different vegetation um, to go in, in its place. So hopefully something of a tree nature that will provide that canopy. But we are also with the Owen Bell, with the grant funds that we got from the state from with the Owen Bell, we'll be able to put up shade structures as well. So they're, while the shade, shade structures are not natural vegetation, they will help to provide that shade as we establish new vegetation out there. But um, I just wanted you to be aware that those trees, you know, um, we agree we want to keep that beauty of our park but sometimes um, it just becomes too much of a hazard and so we did have to remove those two trees we were able to save the third tree the one that's closest to the building that was able to be saved for now we might have to treat that one for disease um, because that one has been impacted but it's not been impacted to the same extent as the other two so we think that we might be able to still save that one at least for a while um, before that one has to get reevaluated. That one also is a little bit, the root ball is more protected on that one because the topography doesn't slant as much. And so um, the heavy foot traffic has not exposed the root ball on that one um, as, and it, and it doesn't have as much impact from the parking lot. So those two trees unfortunately did get impacted and we had to remove those. Um, any questions on that one and I will let you know we are evaluating trees in Owen in uh, Davis Park um, there's been a couple of trees we've been watching for a little bit of time um, and we may need to start making a decision around some of those trees but um, we're you know trying to uh, you know you, you dance a fine line of is you know can can we still keep the tree or is it becoming too much of a hazard right like at what point do you call it done and just put in a new vet, a new tree, right? So we are watching a few of the trees at Davis Park. Um, the last one I didn't put in my update, but I, I still want to provide to you is um, with regards to KMS um, and the funding. I know those that sit on the fiscal subcommittee, we talked about, um, we reviewed um, the upcoming bond issuance that we're getting ready to do for Westfield Avenue and for um, we were potentially looking having at having to do a note to a short-term note for cash flow purposes around um, the KMS project. And that was because, uh, so KMS, we started trying to submit for reimbursements. That's a little over 72% um, reimbursement rate with the state of Connecticut, Office of School Construction. We started, Bob Angeli started, uh, trying to submit for reimbursements through their programming in um, May of last year. And um, things were all jammed up in their process and we weren't able to, you know, they weren't, he wasn't able to upload some of the components. Um, so they were just kind of sitting there. Um, they then changed, Sue came on and was appointed in what eight, uh, August. Um, so she began the process of trying to get activation into the system and then start starting to try and uh, submit those invoices. It took a couple of months for her to even get access into the system. And then trying to submit those invoices, again, it was completely bogged down. She was trying to get all of that reworked. In the meantime, the project, we um, hired a consultant because the state also changed their platform and how you input everything, right? So we hired a consultant that was very well versed in their system. They combined everything and submitted the invoice, right, um, for reimbursement. So it's a $20 million invoice reimbursement that's into the state, 72% that would be reimbursable back to the town, right? It's a big chunk of change that we are currently cash flowing right now, right? And we're getting ready to really kick off the Westfield Avenue project. So, you know, um, we still need to be able to pay bills. So. Um, what we were hearing from the consultant was that um, once that invoice went in, uh, Office of School Construction had 
60 days to review it and push it back to us if there was any concerns. And what they were seeing was instead of 60 days, they were seeing six to eight months on most of their other projects. That gives me heartburn. So um, when I was at that um, cost meeting, the Council of Small Towns uh, annual conference, the commissioner for DAS, uh, Department of Administrative Services, was there um, and she was one of our speakers. As soon as she got off the podium, I beelined it right to her. And I reviewed this with her, and I let her know that it's not 100% it's not the state's fault. We also had our challenges on our side, but at this point, you know, we have $20 million out the door, and I am potentially looking at having to issue a $15 million note for next year that is gonna cost almost $700,000 in interest in our next year's budget, simply because we haven't received any reimbursement yet. She heard me that day, she got, oh, she got back and she immediately contacted the director of Office of School Construction. <laughs> By that afternoon, I had uh, an email from one of the workers that doesn't necessarily, does she, she used to process invoices all the time. She's moved on to a different task, but um, she is asked to retain us because she's worked with us many times in other previous reimbursement cycles. And she's gotten authorization from the director to work nights, weekends, and holidays to get all of our invoices processed. So what had happened before was between Bob and Sue trying to submit things, we had 47 invoices in their system. And so they gotta get through, and 46 of them have no invoices attached to them. So what this worker is doing is she is taking the invoice that doesn't, ha the, the budget the request, that doesn't have an invoice attached to it, finding that invoice in the large invoice that we the large request that we submitted through the consultant that has all the detail attached to it finding it matching it up submitting it for payment right so uh, very static um, we've already started receiving payments so I believe at this point in time we're not going to need to issue notes that's amazing um, really ex Well, it's not really that anybody dropped the ball. It's that the program, in order to upload the um, invoice, um, it was not very, that system is not very clear on how you do that. And they require the superintendents to do that. Um, but without having somebody to be able to, you know, it's like any computer program. If you don't use it all the time, are you really going to remember it five years later? And most of the time they change it, right? And that's what had happened with this was he tried to get everything in there. Um, and he, he really did. But um, unfortunately, the invoices wouldn't attach. And he didn't know it right away until, well, afterwards that we started getting the notifications that the invoices weren't attached, right? But then we're now into a new superintendent, right? And the new superintendent now has to get validated in the system. That takes the state time. That's, it's not just a phone call. They have to go through all of these processes to validate the person, to give them authorizations. Three different um, departments have to get through their process to give that person authorization. Now there's 40 some odd invoices in there. And now she's trying to figure out what they are and how to get things attached. And it wasn't clear, and in the same time, the state is changing the process. So what are we doing going forward? We're gonna likely retain this consultant for this project. Um, I think that makes the most financial sense for us to do that, that can pull together all of these invoices, clearly identify what the state needs, and then essentially walk the superintendent through how to get this actually uploaded in accordance to Office of School Construction's requirements so we can get, so we can get payment through. You know, I think we have a very good line of communication with, we've been assigned essentially this worker, which we're very fortunate for that. Um, and she, it sounds like she's gonna stay with us. I'm just, I'm just thinking that if you submitted an invoice and you didn't get a check, I think you would be very, very upset. Um, when the checks didn't start flowing. No, we know that it's, not really, because we know that it takes time and we were trying to communicate with them. We were calling them and saying, hey, how do we get this going? How do we get this going? And, you know, we had a transition time frame. And it's willing, you know, the new superintendent, first we had an interim superintendent. I can't have an, they won't upload an interim superintendent 
especially one that's in such a short narrow window. So now we're waiting for the second soup the the next the active superintendent to be onboarded. That takes time to get that done and then when we realized that she was stuck, we were trying to reach out to this the, the agency to get it done, Office of School Construction, um, but we were being bounced around, and that's why I went to the de that's why I went to the head. And sometimes that's what you got to do. You just go to the head of the department and say, "We're stuck. We need to get unstuck." What was the date of your first survey? Um, our first one got submitted. I want to say it was right around the beginning of June. And I will say, so the Office of School Instruction has 60 days to even respond. So you're not even going to, it's not like they're going to turn the invoice around in the next week. We know that that doesn't happen. They have 60 days to even contemplate a response to you on the invoice. I, I think it's good that you hired someone, Mary. And uh, I will say that we went through our merger, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know we had a forty thousand dollar invoice that didn't show up for six months and no one caught it and then we had a ninety thousand dollar invoice that didn't no one caught it on all three parties um, for eight months yeah. i mean uh merging three different systems and yeah. you submit and you think it's there and you find out later uh two three months later that the backup isn't attached so uh it does happen when yeah. that many parties are involved. Right, and yeah. it was in just the amount of transitions that we had on our side, and then them transitioning their system at the same time, it just, it was kind of that perfect whirlwind. And so um, we're just, I'm, I'm very I'm very thankful that we've been identified, that um, the, the, the Office of School Construction employee um, has, you know, retained us, um, even though that that's not, and she's been authorized to really get this batched out so so far you know we've um, we've started to receive payments and we're starting to receive them on a regular basis so I know she's cooking through those invoices um, and uh, it's been it's been very good so I'm thankful we're not going to be in that position I don't believe to issue notes on this what's the uh, price of the consult um, I don't I, you know what I don't know that I have that off the top of my head um, I can get that to you I don't want to I don't want to give you a number and then have it be wrong so let me get that for you And that's all I have. Um, the second thing that you did receive for communications was just the um, letter from Board of Education re making their uh, request for um, funding into the non-lapsing. Again, that would come to you as an action item once you re once we're at the um, completion of the audit. So likely uh, next month will when you uh, when that might be an actionable item. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Um, I do have one question. As far as the trees, um, who is doing the analysis of the trees, determining which ones have to come down, um, and are they a licensed arborist? So we have uh, we have four, five, six tree wardens that have all been through arborist school, and um, so they do the evaluation. If they have any concerns that they're like. Mm, I don't know it might be a little bit they'll bring in an outside consultant and have it reviewed so um, all you know we've had several of them weigh in on this one they've been watching those two trees for several years now at this point in time um, and they thought they were gonna they thought the trees were gonna come back but especially that one closest to the splash pad has just been continued to be um, to, to be uh, just deteriorating so it we needed to make that decision Thank you. Um, just so everyone knows, as far as becoming a licensed arborist, it is not something that's easy to do. Um, you really have to know what you're talking about, so, what you're doing, um, in order to become a licensed arborist. So, it so I want to be clear. They're not licensed arborists. They uh, are tree wardens, but part of the tree warden school is part of the arborists. So they do have to understand disease. They have okay. to understand uh, – um, uh, they understand all – the uh, vegetation, um, they have to understand how and, you know, conditions in which a tree needs to be for, you know, for sustaining it. They, 
there is a lot of crossover, but they don't become a licensed arborist. They become a tree warden, which means they essentially cover a lot of, you know, tree species and, um, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of, it's actually, it's very intensive. But I want to be clear. I don't want to mislead anyone. It is, okay. they are not certified arborists. They are tree wardens, but they've gone through a fair amount of schooling, um, all related to trees, tree health, tree disease. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is 14 unfinished business for town council action, and we have none, so we'll move on to new business. Item 15A, consideration and action on the resolution setting the dates, times, and places of the public hearing, the annual town meeting, and the adjourned annual town meeting machine vote on the 2024-2025 budget ordinance. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Uh, Ms. Clory, could you go over this? Sure. So this, um, again, is just um, a requirement for the town council to formally set the dates of the um, public hearing, um, the um, annual town meeting, and then the referendum dates. We followed historical um, date patterns for this. So we historically have always held our public hearing on the second Thursday in April. Um, by charter, it is required to be held by um, honor before um, April 15th. So this is um, April, Thursday, April 11th at the high school. Um, by charter, the annual town meeting is held on the first Monday in May, which would be May 6th. And then historically, we have held our um, all-day machine votes for the budget uh, on Tuesdays subsequent to the annual town meeting. So that would be Tuesday, May 14th, all the same uh, locations that we have um, normally held them at, um, the high school for the public hearing and the um, annual town meeting, and then normal polling locations for the, for the budget vote. Thank you. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to the agenda. Next item up is 15B, consideration and action on the resolution to authorize the town manager to rescind the town's withdrawal from the Northeast District Department of Health. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? A motion has been made by Ms. Barclay, seconded by Mr. Gambatista. Uh, Ms. Clory, could you go over this? Sure. So as you, um, I've reported before, the um, NDDH board has taken uh, many steps that was requested by the um, sending districts. And, um, you know, a total of five districts had actually provided withdrawal letters. Um, since then, the executive director has left. They've uh, begun their search for a new executive director. Um, and they, you know, have been looking at hiring a consultant to come in and look at the overall structure of their um, of their organization. Um, with that, um, the state they have also uh, reached out to the State Department of Health. The State Department of Health has uh, provided them an assistance package, um, and that assistance package would provide them with um, an interim acting um, Department of Health director um, as they search for a new one. Um, and that would be no cost to the district. Um, it would also be able to help them in going through what their current um, processes are. <clears throat> but that um, offer is contingent on all five districts rescinding our withdrawal. Um, I know that, you know, Patty's been at many of these meetings, um, I think all of these meetings. But, um, you know, they've, I think the, um, the finance body of the District Department of Health has worked very hard on truly hearing the concerns of the, of the towns, balancing the inflate, the in, in, you know, their, their costs and the increased costs that they're seeing around, um, around uh, labor and wages. Um, and so right now what they have given to the town for um, a maximum 
um, uh, per capita increase is um, 80 cents. So, you know, um, a very, um, I think a very reasonable and modest increase given the, the pressures on them and given kind of where they're at in, you know, it's a fairly uh, upheaval time period for them in trying to, looking for a new executive director. But um, my recommendation is that the town council um, rescinds that withdrawal. Um, it will cost if the town decides to remain outside of the district um, and we would be looking at establishing our own. All four other towns have rescinded their withdrawals, so we would be standalone. Um, we, it would cost us substantially more. I'm not sure at this point in time that we would really truly be able to establish an entire health department before July 1, which would be when we would have to have one established. Um, and, you know, truthfully, we would be, you know, essentially fighting for the same um, staff members that NDDH is fighting for. And that does a disservice, not just to Killing, but a disservice to the region. Um, so um, my recommendation is really that at this point we rescind and we, and we are only rescinding for one year. We're not locked in for any more than this upcoming fiscal year. So it still allows the town that if, you know, things go sideways before December 31st of this, uh, of this calendar year, you could still make an, an alternative decision. Thank you. Mr. Wayhead. So the executive board, has that changed from past other than the, uh, the director leaving? The, right, the executive director is the only one that has left. The, um, so it's the same board? The board, there has been new members to the board that uh, different towns have actually re either replaced or they've had individuals, uh, their board members have left and they have actually put on people that are either on the board of selectmen either the first selectman, a member of the Board of Selectmen, or the Board of Finance, which um, is something that the members of that board kind of got away from. At one point in time, that board was largely made up of either council members, members of the Board of Finance, or the first selectmen. So they were directly responsible for the budgets within their own communities. What happened over time, you know, as, you know, everybody's times gets you know pulled apart um, towns were appointing individuals that were just volunteers from their towns right and so that individual didn't have a close relationship with the building of their town's budget and so they didn't have that direct link that's where I think a lot of that breakdown occurred within the board themselves where they were like what do you mean the towns didn't you know they didn't have as much direct input from their community because they weren't sitting at the table like you guys are right um so some of the towns have made that shift so they have they do have new involvement and new engagement from uh towns uh like you know patty sits on the on the on the board um before we didn't have a council member sitting on that board um so she can bring the voice to that board that says you know this would be unacceptable or I perceive this to be unacceptable um, to bring this back to the town council um, because we have these other constraints that are directly, you know, impacting our budget, right? Um, so that is definitely a, a change within it. All of the board members have not changed, um, but there is, you know, some movement and change on that. Do you feel that it's changed enough where you feel comfortable? I, I will say I have been very vocal. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I honestly say um, they have listened to all of our concerns. I I even went after the state on the last call. Were you on that? I was. You heard me. Hmm. I did. I called them out because so what they're doing is they're demanding that all five towns that rescinded, all five, pull that letter back, or we're not going to help NDDH. And I said, and how is that not punishing NDDH when they're trying to get ahead? They're trying to help all the towns, and I'm and I did. I said it because I mean I'm not one. I'm not a selectman that can just make a choice. I said I'm one of nine people. I am all for coming back because I've seen the process. I've seen how much work has been done about improving the situation and going forward. I see the plans you have in place. But I'm one of nine people. 
what if we end up with a majority vote that says we're not going to rescind this letter? What happens then? And she basically said, well, we're putting, this is a cost investment for us. Yes. So all five have to rescind or we're not going to send somebody. Right. How, and that's so punitive towards this organization that's working so hard. Right. They, they really are. I mean, I've been at every meeting for the past five or six months, uh, yes. about five months, at least. and I'm on the finance committee now. And <laughs> the transparency from now to a year ago is phenomenal. The work they're doing, I mean, mm -hmm. we definitely should rescind this letter and give them another opportunity. And as right. Mary said, if we, I, I expect to see a big change. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't, for some unforeseen reason, and then we just write another letter before December 31st. But I think it's really important that we give them a chance. I will say even in the letter that we got from them about the potential cap and the increase in the per capita of the 80 cents, they actually had attached to it a full um, budget with explanation as to what was causing the increase and where it was. So versus before all we got was a letter that said, oh, you know, here you go, you got to pay it anyway, right? This was very transparent. They gave all of the detail. Um, it was very good. Um, so, I, you know, I think that the staff that is there are really trying very hard to make sure that they meet the needs. We know that it is going to take them, uh, you know, it's not like all of a sudden the inspection rate is going to go to 100%. There's still a staffing ch challenge there, and that's about getting certifications, right? And the yeah. state... And that's the state's fault, too. Right, but having the state involved is going to help I think move that forward a little bit right. um, a little bit better so you know I think that this um, I truly do believe that I think they've made a lot of progress they have. Um, this has been a very eye-opening experience for them and I think they definitely um, are truly hearing um, the concerns of the towns um, and they are trying to make really fast positive forward movement on addressing them so you know I really think that they've done very well I think in the short time that you know we gave them the information and we said you need to do this this and this or else I think they have come full circle They're, they they have a plan that goes out beyond a year um, they're very transparent we went through they put me on the finance committee as well so we've gone through line item by line item for all the permit fees and every I mean, they were trying, we were trying to break it down between, okay, so per capita and then the fees. So how do we balance this? We can't put, and, and a couple of us fought, we're like, no, we're not going to, a lot of people don't even use the service, but it's per capita, so you have no choice. And what happened last year, we need to balance this out. We understand you need, you know, you have contract negotiations and you have to hire staff, but you have to look at. For one thing, the economy this year is not good. The inflation is crazy. We have to be fair. This is something where we're forced to pay, but we have to be fair. So we need to look at the permit fees and things. And they did, and they did a phenomenal job. So I, I'm very comfortable with w what they have done and where they're at. And, you know, I would expect the other towns probably feel the same way. But I asked Mayor, I'm very vocal, and I went – like this needs to fix and this is not right and mm -hmm. yeah I think they're doing a good job you Thank know you. me if I didn't I would tell you I'm just saying because it does scare me if you had the same people in the same issue you know what I mean and I will say when we're at those meetings even um, even community leaders that are not on their board they have engaged them in the conversation so like myself the first selectman of Pomfret um, even the first selectman of Plainfield, they're not, we're not on the board. We're not technically board members, but they have still engaged us in the conversation on how they can meet the, the concerns. Um, and they've been very, you know, they've really listened to some really harsh criticism. Um, and, uh, and, they're, and, and they're, they're stepping to that plate to fix it. So, you know, I think that given everything that they've done, I think they, they deserve to have that chance and that and and to really prove that for the long haul they're gonna they're gonna revamp it and yeah. I think they will and one thing I want I want to be very clear on and you know not to go after people that aren't there anymore the, the, the a lot of the problem one the state doesn't provide mm -hmm. the training in a consistent enough manner 
for them to be able to get certified in a timely manner. They also, um, I think they just got a new regulation. It's a food regulation because Tammy and I just went through the fast class this afternoon. Um, it's over 600 pages long and it's all new regulations. So they just have to, all the food people, the food inspectors, they have to like just take this and now throw out what they've already been certified and what they've already been doing and they have to learn this and bring it into the field like and they have so much time to do it i mean they are under so much pressure mm -hmm. and of all of the health districts this is the pretty much the smallest staff and the busiest they they are the one of the busiest across the state and because they're rural their job is kind of spread out more than like the more s urban areas too so they are they it's never been about the staff they're staff is phenomenal and I, I give them credit all day long what they do is not easy the requirements to do their jobs I didn't even realize like a lot of their so they have to have a master's degree um, it, it's it's really a lot and they just had really bad leadership right. and they don't anymore so we'll see how they do thank you mr. Brandt else but it, what it took to resend letters by all the five different towns because yep. the previous year, nothing happened. We kind of, well, okay, well, we were late too, but then we yep. were on board say, you gotta yep. fix your act. Nothing seemed to happen. So it's unfortunate that that's what it took. Yep. So, I mean, we, we, we took some act, didn't look good. No, I'm, I'm for, you know, rescinding that now and give them a shot. You know, they're, now they're finally trying. So, you know, from what you're telling us that, I, yep. I appreciate they're doing something. Thank you. Um, having spent um, probably almost 10 years on that board myself, um, the, their finance person is fabulous. Um, she does a really good job of, of getting it to be transparent. Um, and I know when the board that was there when I was on, um, when it came down to where, how do you, you know, do you raise the per capita, you raise the user fees, you know? Um, at that time, they actually, um, the fees weren't matching up with the amount of work because they were trying to keep those down. But then they had to adjust, you know, if, you, if you're using the service, you gotta pay for the service. And so I think um, you're gonna see a lot more, of, you know, things like that happening probably across the board. You know, user fees are gonna have to go up rather than just plopping everything as a per capita or, so, but yeah. Um, their finance person is the same one that's been there and she knows her stuff and she's just very, very, very organized and very good. So. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is 15C, consideration and action on a resolution to authorize execution of a letter of intent with the Green Skies Clean Energy LLC for a Connecticut non-residential renewable energy solution revenue sharing agreement. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? Make motion has been made by Mr. Gambatista. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Grandelsky. Uh, Ms. Gloria, could you go over this? Sure. So I know that this has previously come to the town council. You um, reviewed this back in September um, and uh, had decided not to move forward with it. Um, and the uh, Titan Energy is the consultant for CCM that um, they are not the developers. They just work to help coordinate uh, developers to ultimately the municipalities um, that are required under statute for um, to be uh, receiving revenue share from these projects. Um, but he heard the town council's concerns around, you know, the, um, the lack of uh, direct um, benefit to the host municipality, if you will, the concern around, you know, uh, installing solar on agricultural land, um, that kind of stuff. So um, there's really the, 
So Killingly uh, is largely um, eligible to participate in this because we were formerly a distressed municipality. We lose that designation in, 20, in, in uh, next year, in uh, 2025. And so um, there's one more round that's gonna be coming um, out where the town could participate in the NRES program uh, coming up in March. Um, so, you know, he, uh, he sent this over to me for um, you to reconsider only in that, um, you know, the revenue share agreement could include a portion of the revenue that Killingly is receiving to be sent directly to the um, host municipality of the generation site. Um, also, the site that he's, uh, he was able to, when we were seeing this for fiscal subcommittee, he didn't have a, a, a development or a site yet aligned because uh, we weren't even sure whether or not there would be any pallet to um, reconsideration of this. Um, but since then, um, in you know, just trying to get a better understanding of where Killingly might fit, um, the project that would uh, likely align with our uh, consumption of energy is um, um, it's a uh, defunct golf course in uh, that is uh, in Avon and Simsbury. It's actually split between the two towns, um, and so this wouldn't have any tree removal of any kind. Um, it's a defunct, you know, golf course that's been there for some time. Um, and that's where they're looking, you know, it's privately owned. Um, that's where the installation is uh, proposed to go. So again, um, you know, Killingly just ha Killingly, this letter is for us to engage with the intent to negotiate. It doesn't formally commit us to actually entering into the agreement, but it does mean that we go into the agreement or go into this negotiation um, with good faith and that we truly do intend to negotiate to an end agreement, which would be that we receive revenue share from this. We're approximating that it's gonna be, I think uh, Adam was still approximating that it would be somewhere around the 42 to 45,000 range. Um, for this development for the amount, of, and again, that's based on the kilowatt usage that Killingly has to contribute in or uh, calculate towards that development. So the fiscal subcommittee reviewed this. Um, they did not make any recommendation whatsoever on this. They uh, felt that the council as a whole um, should consider this. And again, um, you know, if the decision really is that, you know, the, that, the, the council is just fundamentally, um, you know, in opposition to the development of solar, then that's the answer and that's fine. Um, if there's an opportunity, this is just an opportunity for the town to receive revenue um, from a program, an incentive program um, that, you know, I mean, if we pass it, if we pass on it and another municipality is going to pick up the revenue. Um, it's, it, you know, an, it ha the revenue has to go to a municipality by statute, um, and so it would go to a different municipality. So again, um, that's the question. So, can I say something? So, I don't think our concern is we're against solar. I, I'm just speaking for me, but I've had conversations with a few of us. Sure. I think it's because it's being put in Avon and Simsbury, you said? Well, that's where this but that's where development the, would be. How much Avon. say does Avon and, Avon and Simsbury have as to this going into their town? That's our concern. Like yes. We are putting something or we're making money for something another municipality is, is going to have to deal with, but are they opposed to it? Do we? And yeah. if so, then my answer would be absolutely no because we wouldn't want it done to us. But if they're on board then the revenue goes to them. I don't see mm. how we get revenue. Like, it doesn't make sense to me to put it somewhere else and we they don't have a say. I just want to interject on this. Um, I did hear those concerns that when this got voted down previously, mm -hmm. when this got brought back forward, I did have conversation with Ms. Glorio. I also brought it up during fiscal, where the only way I would be in favor of this is if between, if this were to pass tonight and we, ent we enter into this, um, that we would have the conversation with wherever it was going and they would have to be on board with it. That's what I'm saying. I would also be open to sharing whatever revenue it is that we're getting if it was, now Avon Simsbury, is that just one 
fiscal two, body or is two towns? It's two separate towns. Both towns would receive their tax revenue, not just for the land, but for the equipment that's uh, that's on there. So they, they receive tax revenue. Um, but um, again, it is, you know, <clears throat> because of the size of the development, it does go through siting council. I have not had a conversation with Avon and Simsbury um, with regards to what, you know, if, if they've had any collective conversation in the community around around this. It sounds from the overall um, understanding that I have because it's a defunct, you know, um, golf course. Um, th there's not a concern, right? There's not a concern around um, the, uh, you know, a significant devegetation of an area or around um, the inactivation of agricultural land, right? Um, that this is really just, you know, utilizing a, a defunct space that's kind of really just gone to dilapidation, right? Um, that's my understanding at this point. Again, I have not had any direct conversations yet with An with Ando, with um, Avon, or, Avon or Simsbury. I do know administrators that are in there. I, I can eventually give them a call, but again, I don't, you know, I don't know collectively where this body is on, on this, um, you know, and I wasn't really sure even coming out of fiscal subcommittee that there was any true palette for this. Um, and if there isn't, that's okay. Right. I, we can, we can turn it down, but, um, again, it's just, you know, just trying to see if they're having the revenue option for the municipality. Cause if we decline it, it's another municipality. It has to go to another municipality. It's not like it can stay with the developer and it's not like it can necessarily go to, um, you know, some other fund. It has to go to a municipality based on the legislation. Um, so it was, it, it's the way they developed that specific required incentive program. That's what the legislation did to provide revenue. So, um, again, that's just trying to get an understanding here. And again, we could in the agreement decide, you know, if Killingly wanted to share that revenue with the other two towns on some split, you could potentially, you could look at doing that. Um, or you decline the whole thing right I looked at it as a way of um, it then puts us in a position where we can give some say to the towns where this would be cited at whereas normally um, now the previous project that we declined to sign on that already got approved correct yeah there's already um, other municipal sponsors on that one and that one's already so moved that through. that That's money that through. we would have been eligible to receive went to another town are you aware if whatever town signed on instead of killingly reached out to scotland oh, or I don't made any they offer did. okay the scotland first selectman works for the town of killingly so i know him quite personally but um and there's no concern scotland doesn't have any concern around that project Right. And so my thought was, and as I had stated during fiscal, um, I would want to give, and by us signing on instead of another town, if we're willing to say we're going to sign on, but if either of these towns doesn't want it there, we have the option to withdraw. So it would actually give those towns some say where they normally wouldn't have say. And if we chose to, it would also give us, we would have the ability to share some of that 42 to 45,000 a year with the other towns that are having this cited there. Um, hearing now that it's a, uh, a defunct golf course, I think of the fact of, um, to my knowledge, a defunct golf course, depending on how long it's been defunct, um, you have issues with what you can do because of the amount of pesticides. fertilizer and pesticides that they've used Absolutely. to where you're limited as to what you can put there. Whereas if you put solar, it gives the ground a chance the to, in a sense, to recover. Yeah. Um, it's actually considered a brown field. Yes. Because of the amount of uh, pesticides and fertilizers that's used on a golf course to maintain it. Um, and so, yes, it does have to go through a significant period of rest. So that, and so my opinion, and I know there was basically very little support for this last time around, um, if we can give the towns where this would get stuck being in this, in this situation, Avon and Simsbury, a chance for them to be heard whether they want it there or not and we have the ability to back out if they say if they both say we're fine with it um, I would be fine with it as well if they have no issue with it going in 
but I think it gives us an opportunity to give them a say as to something that could be coming into their town, whereas the previous one we declined and Scotland ended up with it without Scotland actually having any kind of say. Um, and then, like I said, it also gives us the opportunity we could share the revenue because we're not dealing with any of the impact of, oh, well, we've got the traffic when they're installing it. Um, we don't have to deal with see, looking at the solar panels instead of seeing a, a golf course. Um, but we'd be getting revenue and we have the opportunity to share some of it with them. Um, that was my thought behind um, putting this to the full council. And as Mary had said, the fiscal subcommittee did not make any kind of recommendation. Um, fiscal subcommittees uh, moved this to the full council for consideration. Um, I, I totally understand. Um, you wanted that transparency to the other towns and wanting them to be on board with it and have it not forced on them. I looked into this uh, uh, just a little bit after the meeting because I thought about it completely different when I was sitting in on the fiscal subcommittee than when I looked at it after. Um, so I think just like you said, Patty, solar, I don't know, there, there's, you know, if there was a perfect power source, you know, we, we, you know, the world would be a better place. There's, there's no perfect. I looked at the efficiency of it. It's 17 to 20 percent. You mentioned getting rid of it. None of that's great. Then I looked at the other side of it and, the, you know, the, the way that the way that they've done this is it's, it's already been settled. And am I correct or am I incorrect that these are private landowners? Correct. All private landowners, so all private developers. So wanted to do this, what would it take for us to stop that? You wouldn't be able to. It goes to siting council. The only thing that you could do is put in requirements. Our planning and zoning and our inland wetlands okay. would be able to put in comments to the siting council. Um, and the siting council largely does incorporate those in the requirements. But if it's, you know, that's, that's really the process for these. So the local municipalities don't necessarily get to say yay or nay on them per per se. Per se. Well, I like your thought of you. I don't want. I'm not. I like. Uh, I like democracy. I like uh, seeing both sides of the coin. I, I totally agree with that. That being said, it's 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 already been decided. It's it's going to be done. And when I looked at it from that point of view, I just looked at it completely completely different. And I thought it has it has no environmental um, impact to us. It has. There's no safety issues for any of the citizens here and I thought for me it was going to be hard to vote against it I, I didn't see I looked into the other side of it and you know what I always noticed was every time I went to Lowe's the person wearing the shirt was a different name and I was like boy this is a terrible system how come none of these companies Jason can make it well when you look into it what happens is federally the regulation is given to given to Eversoles mm -hmm. so do you think do you think they want their market share taken they do not no one gives away market share so when you look at this, at least here, however it was done, maybe the legislation doing this, maybe it is meant to give to us as a distressed municipality, but it's saying these two people are entering into this agreement, CCM and Titan, even though they're not the developer, they've accepted these terms. They know they're still gonna make money off of putting these solar so fields in Avon and- it's the, develop right? it's the developer that's entering into the agreement, not CCM isn't entering into it, they're just helping to- yeah. tell them where the well it's really they're just helping them yeah. gather the um gather the electrical uh usage of the municipalities and um match them to or let the developer know hey this one matches with yours so they that's all that titan and ccm is doing is doing that but these developers have already made a deal with the landowner okay they've made a develop they've made a deal with the developer um, the landowner has made that agreement already. Um, they are going to submit into this um, uh, this in, incentive program. Um, and largely, based on the incentive program and the cost to develop, the amount of revenue share is already calculated, right? So there's not really a huge amount of negotiation on that. It's already pretty much known, and it's going to be based on how much energy they're offsetting with that solar that's really what this boils down to and the state in order for um, eversource to receive the, the the additional funding for this incentive the state legislation put in the caveat that they had to share revenue to the municipalities and prioritized distressed municipalities and, uh, that, that just changed my opinion of eversource doesn't want to pay them 
they don't want to buy that from the solar company because they're not looking forward to buying it when they're used to producing it and charging you and I whatever they can charge you for it. So it's, to me, I looked at it, it was, it was hard for me to vote against it and say to the, the, the constituents that, the, you know, that there's, there's no, it's, it's happening no matter what. But I do like, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you that if there's, if there's pushback and they're throwing up flags there that they're totally against it, I, I'm, I, I'm with you 100%. So, I mean, are we selling our soul for $45,000? How much are they making? They wouldn't they tell us you how much. Brought, you had brought up, you know, where's the transparency of what you're, what you're making? They if wouldn't tell us. If you get this little piece of the pie, they won't tell you exactly what they're making. You're right. Yeah, I think both I think you just look at it both ways. I, I think I think both entities, the way it's being, I think they, I'm sure they don't want to give up the percentage, and I'm, sh I'm sure on the other side, I, I, I'm sure they're at odds on both sides. I, it, N neither of them want to give up any part of the pie to anyone. Right. I'm certain, right. certain of that. The state it has the is not getting <coughs> any. Um, There's the state has so the town is not getting any tax revenue. They're only getting the revenue for the defunct golf course. They're not getting the revenue as a business. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that money is coming out of our pockets. The, and that was the one question on my next question, because um, there's no such thing as free money. It's coming from somewhere. The money that for the money that covers the incentive, um, I I know it's in a sense coming from the developer. The developer sharing the revenue. Um, however, th that money comes from somewhere. Is this program is this program funded by? Um, state revenue is it funded by eversource on a bill to rate rate payers um how is this program so funded it's the con it's a portion of the construction costs that are funded and it's through and it's the it is through state incentives state state funding through eversource and and developing the incentive program so it is state through welfare. state well, it's money. Yeah. <laughs> well you're going to pay welfare. for it for solar anyway it's that, that's it, it, it's, that's it, the downfall. It's, it's, it's change. It's something that's not comfortable. But it's, it's, it's more it, principal than anything else. But it, and but it's not environmentally safe. So it's impacting it's, us it's no matter free, what. There's no free money that we pay for. There is no environmentally safe with anything, with any, uh, with yeah, any no. source of, uh, of fuel. Nuclear. We know that. That's, nuclear. That's, yeah. that's, nuclear. Well, nuclear, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Nuclear fusion is the best. But people that say they want to do that, they're afraid of it. They say that they're out of their minds. Yep. And that's another story. Yep. But I can't. I just respectfully, um, I, I just, uh, I can't tell the people that I think it's a bad thing. Um, we're, you know, we're, it's going to happen one way or the other. And um, that's, that's, that's why, you, that's the beauty of democracy. <coughs> you get to believe what you believe. Uh, I'm not against solar. I'm only against forced solar. Uh, just, it's late. I, I, it makes me think of a story when I was an iron worker. Uh, we'd be working, and it would start to snow really hard, and we were up on the iron and painted iron, and we'd all come down. And it wouldn't slow down, and the foreman wanted that piece up, and he'd say, get back up there, and he'd go right down the line, and he'd ask you, you're going to go up there? No, nope, it's too dangerous. You're going to go up there? No, it's too dangerous. You're going to go up there? No, it's too dangerous. And he'd go down the line until he found that person that would go up there. And there's a word for that, which I'm not going to say, but I'm not going to do that today. See that? <laughs> Just like I wouldn't do it then. Any further comments? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 Motion fails. <coughs> we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is fifteen D. Consideration and action on a resolution to authorize the town manager to execute documents necessary for a grant of two hundred and ten thousand dollars 
for the Owen Bell Park improvements. Can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Ms. George. And Ms. Gloria, could you go over this, please? So the state um, awarded the town um, 210000 I reported on that previously. We had submitted that um, request a little over a year ago. That's going to be for um, those uh, shade structures, a toddler splash pad, and some other improvements throughout the park. Um, this is just a formalized process. The state likes to do this every single time they issue us a grant, is that they want a formal resolution. So again, this is their exact wording that's required. Um, in order for me to be able to sign off on those grant documents. That's really all that is. Thank you. Question, discussion? Now, do we had a motion and a second on this. Yes, correct? you do. Yes, okay. Yeah, we do. Um, seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to the agenda. Um, I will entertain. Can, can we um, combine? Yeah, we already brought that up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was right where I was going. I will entertain. Okay, I'll let you finish. Over yep. <laughs> I will entertain a motion uh, to adopt items 15E through. 15K. I'll make that motion. Awesome. Yep. Motion has been made by Ms. Barclay, seconded by Mr. Gambatista. Um, Ms. Caloria, could you go over this, please? Sure. So these are the annual policies that we are um, reaffirming, if you will, um, that are relating to our small cities grant programs and our um, community development block grants. Um, currently, the town is administering um, an $810,000 grant for the upgrade to the domestic violence shelter. So these, are, all of these uh, reaffirmations are required as part of that grant process. And Thank largely, you. most of them are required by federal and state law anyway. <laughs> so it's just reaffirming them all. Thank you. Questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to the agenda. Next item up is 15L, consideration and action on a resolution authorizing the town manager to sign a temporary land to access agreement between the town of Killingly and Whole Forest Products for the use of land at 162 Louisa Beams Drive. Can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Catula, seconded by Ms. George. Ms. Clory, could you go over this, please? Sure. So um, Hull Forest Products is actually uh, contracting my, with Myoshi America to do some harvesting on Myoshi's property. Um, but to access that property, um, they need to get through uh, a portion of the town's property. They will actually be utilizing Connecticut water property for the um, landing and loading areas of the actual harvesting. So if you, the best way I can explain it is if you um, look at the map that I provided. Um, you can see the um, yellow highlighted area. That's the town of Killingly parcel. Um, just to the uh, south of that, you can see the, the water tower on the Connecticut water property. Um, the Myoshi America, you can see solar panels over there. It's, that, it's, it's really that, fo that forested area um, that they're doing selective harvesting. Again, this is a selective harvesting. There's been a lot of damaged trees uh, due to disease um, and gypsy moths. It's been very um, difficult. They do have a walking path through there that their, that their, um, their employees use. Um, and so part of this is also for safety purposes as well because some do kind of walk through that um, wooded area. So um, they need to do that harvesting. Really what they're looking to do is ac access the town's uh, property through an existing access road. There's an access road there right now that Connecticut Water uses in order to get back to their property. So they basically are entering on Louisa Vian Louisa Vian's drive in between these two build the building structures, the uh, six and five building structures. That's where the access easement begins. And then you can kind of see it as the green dotted line that goes through the our property. So we are agreeing to allow them to use the access road um, 
they cannot they can only um, remove vegetation um, to maintain that access road so if there's any areas that are overgrown they are allowed to move back but that's the only thing they're allowed to do on that property if they have uh, damaged the access road in any way they have to return it to the condition that it is right now before they utilize before they use this so it's very temporary they're only expecting to complete this i believe it's a short duration of time that they're looking to 12 months so a very short duration of time um, to com to complete this, we did do a we did a similar type of um, access agreement with um, with uh, Richard Fedor um, for his property up along Pratt Road um, for him to do a selective harvesting out there as well, and his was actually a three year um, time frame. So. Um, this is us, and he actually was making a landing pad and everything because that was the only access to, to the road property. So this is a very minimal impact to the town um, and to the, our overall property because it's an existing established access, uh, uh, access roadway that's used regularly by Connecticut Water. Uh, just for clarification, um, on the black and white map, well, with the pink line on it, um, yes. Where it shows a truck turnaround, it actually says Town of Killen. That parcel's Connecticut Water. Yeah, it's actually Connecticut Water. Yeah, that's actually Connecticut Water's um, uh, water tower water area. Tower. Yeah. And the harvesting is um, basically um, closest to the Alexander Parkway because I believe there's an uh, entrance yes. or exit on Lake Road. Yeah, so it's actually, um, there is some really significant topographical changes that occur right along um, Alexander Parkway, which is why they can't get in from Alexander Parkway. So it's really kind of more towards the uh, left-hand side of the water tower that the, the bulk of that harvesting is going to take place. Yeah, not, near Ale not really near Alexander Parkway because of the topo topography. They don't really have good access through there. Well, that the question was the parcel actually runs all the way to Lake Road. It does. So the, they're not doing harvesting close to Lake Road. It's all towards the back. End yeah, of the it's property. really all okay. towards the back of that property. Yeah. Thank you. Are they going to be responsible for any damage or any wear and tear on the road? Yes. That's in their contract. Yep, that they'll be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And they're also responsible for any erosion control measures or anything like that to prevent, you know, anything from, you know, eroding off the road. Mm -hmm. They also are, uh, they have, we have um, designated hours so they can only work, operate it Monday through Saturday, um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we limit that as well, all within that, con within that contract. Didn't we have a question on this Saturday? But there's no there's no residents. No, there. this is the industrial park. Yeah. There'll be more truck traffic from the industrial park than from this. Yeah. So it's only selective cut, and that's that's parcel number eight. I'm assuming is where the work is going to be. Yes. So they're not putting more solar field out there. No, they're not. They're just doing selective harvesting from the damaged trees. Okay. Yeah. They. Any further questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is council member reports and comments. Mr. Grandowski, would you start? Um, Conservation Commission, um, we had a meeting tonight, but we're here. Um, Last time they were looking at their environmental award, um, looking for a recipient for that. Um, they're still, every time they talk about their uh, bus courts, um, they're looking at creating another one. Uh, so they have another choice, but that's in the works. Um, and they were looking at um, um, conservation easements, whether or not they should sponsor a program for the public on how to create a conservation easement on your property. They've talked about that over over time, and that's sort of a recurring subject. Thank you. And is there anything like we still talk about Chase Chase Road and the, you know, uh, the 
plan uh, to do a... Um, yeah, we were actually um, talking to uh, another forester, um, a uh, forester that to uh, help us in creating the forest management plan. We had put it out to bid. We didn't receive any bids. Right. In talking to the um, area, the foresters that are in this area, that was they didn't have enough time at that point in time. So we uh, have re-engaged in those conversations. Um, we may not even actually. We're, we're looking at whether or not the price is actually going to be low enough that we won't have to put it out to formal bid, but rather get uh, quotes instead. Um, and if we're able to do that, then um, that may actually prove to be more fruitful. So we're trying to work work through that uh, planning and development. Um, had a meeting with them Friday. I didn't. I haven't had a chance to circle back with them. Thank you, Mr. Gambatista. Um, I sat in for uh, Ms. Wakefield on the at the Board of Ed meeting, uh, Board of Rec. I'm sorry, Ooh. and the Board of Rec meeting was uh, excellent. I was a coach for 30. Two years, so it was right up my alley. Um, I'll give you, I wouldn't say any, there was any negative, but I guess a couple of things that were uh, jumped out at me is they were talking about the Westfield Ave project. Um, they're looking at uh, moving in July 1st of 2025. Uh, that's kind of tentative. They thought it was going to be earlier than that. That's kind of where they were. Uh, there was a couple concerns there with youth wrestling. They used the old cafeteria there, if that was going to continue. Then they talked a little bit about the auditorium. I don't know if, how many people here have been in that auditorium, but it's the largest auditorium in the 10 town area. It's beautiful. It's bigger than the high school. Uh, it's gonna be, it should be great, but there was some, somebody decided to take the sound system. So the sound system was stolen and there was a little bit of steam damage on the, on the stage. <laughs> so that made them unable to do testing of the lights and the sound system. So there could be additional costs there. That was, again, I have to throw that in, but it's, I think, you know, kind of the part of where we were. But on the positives, uh, the fall program review, uh, they went through the spectacular. They had over 50, 52 floats. They expect to have at least 75. Uh, that was really good. They're trying to figure out a way to continue it down towards more towards Commerce Ave to have more people on you know, that end of downtown. Maybe some creative ways, maybe uh, some games, so something to kind of continue it all the way down Main Street. The winter, uh, the winter uh, and spring programs, all the winter programs are full. All the senior programs, they do senior movies. They're getting 50 to 60 people to see the senior movies. They even have an 18 to three-year-old program for movement. They talked a little bit about the theater on Broad Street. I had no idea that that's, you know, how little they get. You know, they're, they're not obviously a necessity. The, the, the amount of people volunteering, building the sets was just am amazing. They actually did a show for people that had kids that were sensory. Um, I have a son on the autistic spectrum, so it hit me where you could come in and the, the children didn't have to worry if they were behaved in the theater. They could you know, kind of be free to be themselves. And I thought that was, I just thought it was uh, really wonderful. The one thing uh, that they did say was a lot of people come to the theater and they'll say, I had no idea you were here. And that struck me that uh, as, as well as they do, a lot of people don't even know that it exists. I uh, don't know where we could help there, um, but it, I just I found that interesting. I've been to a bunch of things there, mostly because my son did it. Uh, they talked about the fire uh, the fireworks. They looks like they're they'd like some of the kids Kilney Business Associ uh, Kilney Business Association. They'd like maybe some more sponsors. They're lean on where they are uh, for where they normally would be this time of the year. Um, and then they talked about volunteer of the year. They're going to give two. Uh, they feel that they deserve one from the theater department every year because of the time. And then they're going to appoint one from another program. So I thought it was, um, uh, I just think they're doing a great job there. It's the first time I haven't coached in a number of years since uh, my son just graduated high school. So it's been four years that I haven't done any of that. And uh, it was enlightening. I'll probably just go back just to, just to see what's going on. But it was, it was very good, very positive. Thank you. Mr. Whitehead. I have Thank you. Ms. Murphy. Well, I met with the sewer department twice. I have like a ton of notes, but uh, tonight we met with them and um, finance report. They're on target. They're looking at getting a new gravity uh, belt. Um, they priced out a new one. It was 225000 and they decided they're going to repair the old one instead at 131000 <coughs> Um, they're still working on the uh, admin building HVAC that, that started to go, but they're having some sensor issues, so that's a holdup. 
North Lane to Maple Street sewer lining. Uh, they approved $138,000 uh, to bid for Company Green River. Uh, Reynolds Street, I talked about that last time. Continuation of the I&I &I study, uh, they got, I think it's like a two over, a little bit over $250,000 proposal from Wright Pierce to do phase two, but they're going to put that on hold and look at the old scope and uh, go back and see whether they want to finish uh, repairs from the first uh, phase one before they do that, they want to look again. Um, they're going to take some, uh, care of some uh, repairs at Alexander Lake with the grinder pumps that go to individual houses, which I didn't know they did. It's just very interesting. Uh, you're shaking your head, Mary. Is that uh, just the contract, that 3200 or is that for one pump? One pump. Yeah. Well, that's what I figured, but I was just... Yeah, one <laughs> pump. Okay. <laughs> um, and the big thing is that they decided tonight uh, they were going over next year's budget and they did it off of a 10% rate increase. So that's the water department. <coughs> and I also met with the Board of Education. Um, I had two meetings since we last saw you. Uh, January 24th, Dr. Nath gave a presentation of the climate survey the school gives out. They give out a questionnaire to examine the morale of the student body, the faculty and staff, and the families, and she talked a lot about that and uh, had success with it. <coughs> uh, Dosh, Dr. Nash also presented expenditures from the 2022 budget, non-lapsing fund, and uh, that was the letter we got seeking the $411,000 uh, replenishment of non-lapsing, but that's on hold, right, because of... Waiting for the audit. Yeah. Uh, the next part is a little confusing because some of the issues were <laughs> raised both on the 24th and February 14th. So they're just kind of, the dates are kind of jumbled together, but this is basically what happened. Um, on January the 24th, the meeting, there was much discussion concerning the fact that the new legal counsel was hired, uh, both for the 10-4-B complaint, uh, which is uh, one attorney, and then uh, rehired as a uh, the regular attorney. The procedure was in question with some of the BOE members claiming that in order to hire a new lawyer for the 10-4-B complaint, there needed to be a bidding process. Uh, the BOE would have to vote with a clear two-thirds majority to avoid that bidding process. So that's a disagreement that's going on right now. Members question that this did not happen. The legal counsel, Shipman and Goodman, who was on site but not hired as of yet, gave legal counsel on the fact that only a portion of the BOE rules requiring two-thirds majority to avoid the bidding process was surpassed. There is still disagreement on this issue. The BOE voted to renew a previous engagement agreement with Shipman and Goodman. Some members of the board protested the fact that they did not get to see the new engagement letter. The BOE voted to begin an engagement agreement again with Shipman and Goodman without seeing any engagement letter or any finance costs. February 14th, BOE voted to appoint Brian Sheldon for one year position as KIS principal. BOE voted to make the athletic director position a full-time position. BOE gave a synopsis of the temporary heating system uh, because a student had complained that it was too hot and now uh, they're getting daily readings that average out at 67.7. Uh, there's three units on the roof. <coughs> Dr. Nash presented a capital plan current to, I have 2029 20, here, oh, okay. <coughs> uh, uh, oh yes, that, that's correct, going out to 2029. 20, most immediate needs were main focuses, uh, the new access road to the lower field of the Killingly High School, new doors, entryways, and a redesign of the office space for the Killingly Intermediate School, redesign and paving the driveways of Killingly Central School, Goodyear Commission, and functional study for renovations. BOE had Shipman and Goodman in to answer the question of who, was, who has the right on the BOE to seek legal counsel. Um, he said, uh, Shipman and Get Goodman said, the only people that can seek his legal counsel on, on the border Bed are Dr. Nash, the Board of Ed Chair and Vice Chair, or the entire board has to vote. So therefore, he would not discuss the previous month's public questioning regarding two-thirds majority vote and the bidding process. So basically, the issue was raised in public, and no, nobody really knows 
whether that was legal or not, and we're, we're public isn't allowed to know. So I think it's very strange. <laughs> um, BOE voted to settle the 10-4-B complaint and to end any complaints issued against the state. BOE discussed an executive session recent FOIA complaints issued against it regarding the procedure for hiring their legal counsel. Dr. Nash presented the draft budget. The budget comes in at $48 million, 699,886, 4.05% <laughs> increase. Dr. Nash mentioned that they reduced the original budget already down from 4.98% by asking every department to cut 15% off anything but their salaries. Uh, this resulted in a 0.93% dec discount decreased to the 4.05% I just talked about. Dr. Nash then presented some decision packages, director of mental health, athletic trainer, math interventionist, two paras, part-time custodian, and board certified behavioral analyst. If approved, these decision packages in total add 0.89%. This would bring the school budget ask up to 4.94% increase. Their budget is still in process. This is only a draft. Uh, Board of Ed will be reviewing this budget in the next few weeks and looking at the decision packages. I had two questions from the Board of Ed, Mary. Uh, one was, are we going to have uh, townwide trash pickup, which is a no, right? Correct. Correct. And that was voted on um, by the townspeople at referendum and was de defeated. Okay, and the other one was, uh, do we have any numbers for the total increase of the grand list yet um we the grand list is filed um i still have to get the breakdowns of that and in, to incorporate the um exemptions okay so not yet not yet yeah right. and wouldn't any decisions from baa have an effect on a grand list they do but we always incorporate a collection rate because that impacts every year um and so we usually we might give a slightly higher percentage of uh, collection rate or lower percentage of collection rate because we know that we have um, a higher number of um, applicants for appeals this year. Thank you. Mr. Cattula. Um We had a permanent building meeting, uh, a walkthrough of the KMS school, and uh, it's, it's a nice project. It's, they've done a lot over there. It looks very nice. Uh, and to touch on what Michelle was saying about the heating issue, uh, there was one student that has a uh, temperature sensitivity, and the heating units are on the on the roof, but the thermostats are are remote in the hallways, and the teachers, when they would go into the classroom, were closing the doors on some of the classrooms, so the heat would just continually run because it wasn't making it into the hallway to uh, tell the thermostat to shut off. So they've got. Uh, temperature monitors in the rooms and they you know and through instructions and whatnot now they've got it to where it's maintaining temperature and humidity levels uh, so that that's been rectified but they have to keep an, an eye on that and again this is a t this is still temporary heat we're waiting for the f permanent units to come in so that's not the permanent right. uh, installation at this point in time this is only a temporary heat situation we're anticipating the permanent units to be in um, and installed in the spring. Um, that's basically it. The, the, the temperature issue for the temporary heat, they've got it under control and uh, monitoring it so that they don't have any more issues with uh, temperature sensitive issues. The classrooms are cute. I mean, it's very nice over there. The media center there is, it's other than their benches that are hard, but it's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, don't want anybody to get too comfortable. No, they it is a they do, they've done it's a very nice. good job, and it is a, it's a really good project. <laughs> when is their next walkthrough at KMS? I would assume at the next uh, permanent building meeting, the first Wednesday. Yeah, they've been trying to do one before every uh, before yeah, every permanent building doing meeting. It, yeah, at so six o'clock. Do it at six. Thank you, Ms. Wakefield. Um, so we had solid waste sub. We met for our organizational one, um, and then we decided to have the one just to specifically discuss what um, they brought to us tonight. Um, I, I, I think we had a lot of going back. Ed and and, and Kevin and I, you know, it, I think, you know, the proposed increases are are fair. They're reasonable. 
Um, and it's just a matter of time to see how, how many of, you know, if we're gonna get more permits versus, you know, people, you know, using services. I mean, we, we were just, you know, we had that discussion that, you know, quor quarterly pickups for some of these cans at house private homes are like $150 a quarter. So, and, you know, depending on how much garbage you're putting out, I guess it would have to, it might even be cheaper for you to go get a permit. So who knows, we might um, end up with more people using it and maybe that'll, that'll, but ultimately our goal was to make sure we lowered the, um, the general fund subsidy. Um, and I do wanna say, um, um, I was really Im impressed. Um, two of my children went through the ag program and um, I went to their um, holiday sh program and a lot of their students had um, their, their businesses that they've started um, and selling their products. Um, they're learning marketing skills and, and things like that. Um, really, really a great program and also Kudos to the Killing High wrestlers for not only taking ECCs but also taking the state title. So, thank you. Um, I attended uh, fiscal subcommittee and personnel subcommittees, and the fiscal subcommittee was we discussed the solar and res project earlier. Ms. George. Oh, sorry. Um, so I attended um, multiple NDDH meetings. Um, we are looking at up to an 80 cent per capita increase um, for the budget. It could be lower, but I think it's gonna be at the 80 cents. Um, I attended the Eastern Regional Tourism District um, regular and marketing meeting. Um, as the liaison for that group, my job is to promote Killingly businesses with anything to do with tourism. So to everybody listening out there, even if there's five of you, um, <laughs> just say it. Watch it later. Um, if you're a restaurant, if you're a vendor, a church group, a nonprofit, a community organization, a small business, uh, my job is to get you on the CT Visit website to promote any upcoming events you have. Um, so send me, you know, a little blurb about your business. We have so many new small businesses that could really, this could help them. So send me like a small blurb about your business, all your contact info. Um, make sure they're square pictures like Instagram pictures or Facebook for any things you have up, any um, events you have coming up and we will get them on the website. They are working so hard to push the quiet corner, um, the last Green Valley, because don't forget we're competing with the other side of the state, we're competing with the casinos, we're competing with Mystic. So we need to get as much information out there to bring people here. Um, ND, uh, NDDH, I said, Eastern Regional Tourism, and you can send the information to my um, town website. And I have NECOG on Friday morning. Um, right now, we're looking at the legislative session and some of the upcoming um, things they're gonna be talking about, and we wanna get that out to the public so they can send letters, testimonies, whatever. We need to keep on top of what's happening in Hartford. Whoop. And that's all I have. Um, just one quick thing. Yes. When we're having ribbon cutting ceremonies for the businesses in town, is that something that we can, the town can coordinate with Patty on to get onto the tourism website? Sure, we always try and make yeah. sure we get all the information. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be a way to help them out yeah. as well. A little bit more advertising for free. So it goes on the website and then they have, I think it's a quarterly, um, like a magazine that goes out. So it's like in real time. So it's, you say somebody's coming to this area for the weekend. If they're gonna be, they can go on, click on Killingly. And then there's different, um, different groups like where you wanna eat, what do you have for like artists? What do you have for like entertainment? Are there any plays? And they just dial down on there and pick what they wanna do. So I don't know if the ribbon cutting would be like advantageous to put on there, but the, the businesses getting their content to me to put on there once they're established is really important. Okay. Correct, yeah, I think the ribbon cutting is such a short turnaround time for that. It would be hard to get that on there, but 
if the um, organ if they have you know whatever they have for an actual business it's important to get that information yes. up onto that website what was the name of the website it's ct visit oh what was the other thing the newsletter or something oh they do they do like a magazine that you can pull up on what there. is that it's beautiful um it's the tour is a magazine so it's for the eastern regional tourism district i'll send you the link ms barclay uh, the Housing Authority and Planning and Zoning meetings were at the same time yesterday. I did attend the Planning and Zoning. Um, there was a public hearing on the Pineville Ro Weir Road um, multifamily um, development. Um, 15 um, homes, 11 single family, two duplexes, all rentals. There were some um, changes made. The, um, Neighbors are are not very very happy, but um, that public hearing was closed and um, the project was approved with um, some provisions. There was a public hearing for Chestnut Hill, a home-based um, business out of a garage for welding and fabrication. Um, that public hearing was closed and the project was approved. There was a public hearing on a text change amendment. It was presented as um, a developer needed clarification of a multi-family um, development. And what it turned out to be is the developer wanted um, the text change to um, increase the densities within the within Killingly. Um, wanted to go up 50% on low density and then also it affect medium density and then high density within the borough. Um, wanted to um, change the 40 feet in between um, homes to uh, the minimal fire codes and as it was presented by um, that um, those fire codes could actually be just a wall that would um, be used as suppression so and um, this check change amendment would, would also um, get rid of um, the number of houses um, based on, so if you lived in a, a rural area, it would be one per 80,000. Um, low density is one per 30,000 if you have sewer. So that would, would have, the developer's proposed tax change amendment would have gotten rid of that. Um, so it's continued to March 18th where um, the developer said he would try to make it more palatable. Um, new business um, for um, Bailey Hill Road, um, they want to um, build a garage in an accessory department. And um, the next meeting, which is on March 18th, there will be a workshop at 6 o'clock, and it is to go over um, what um, is the definition of open space. Brian Card said that the developers are taking advantage of open space and cons calling open space when something is not open space. And that is it. Thank you. Uh, moving on in the agenda, next item up is item 17, executive session for potential sale of town property vacant land, par land parcels. Um, can I get a motion to move into executive session, including the town council, the town manager, and the finance director? I'll make that motion. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Mr. Gambatista. Uh, discussion? Can we get a five-minute break, or do I make a motion after? Uh, we, we can... Take a five minute recess while we go into executive session because okay. we got to close doors, turn white ma noise machines on. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And it is currently 10 15 p.m. I have to go. My ride's out front. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.